three months by the British government. This morning, government health officials testified about the health risks posed by losing about a half of the U.S. supply of vaccine. This is two hours, 50 minutes. Thank you. Good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order, and I want to welcome everybody to today's oversight hearing regarding recent developments in the U.S. influenza vaccine supply. As many of you know, a major flu vaccine manufacturer announced on Tuesday it would be unable to deliver any of its flu vaccine to the United States. British regulators suspended the manufacturer's license and held up the doses destined for the United States because at least some of the supply was contaminated. The loss of the Chiron flu vaccine poses a serious challenge to the U.S. vaccine supply for the upcoming flu season. Chiron was to export between 46 to 48 million flu shots this year to the United States, almost half of our nation's supply. The Department of Health and Human Services had planned for a vaccine supply of about 100 million doses uh, this season uh, after a demand of about 87 million doses last flu season. Today, We'll examine the contributing factors that led to the severe flu vaccine shortage, the public health implications of the vaccine shortage, and the U.S. government and vaccine manufacturers' plan to address this problem. Our government witnesses are here today to reassure and inform the public. The public health implications of this development are potentially enormous. Every year, approximately 36,000 people die, and 200,000 people are hospitalized due to complications from influenza. With a significant shortage of vaccines, the number of people who die from or are hospitalized for, influ for, for influenza could increase drastically this year. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention issued interim recommendations for influenza vaccinations on October 5, 2004. They give priority for vaccination with Fluzone, the primary vaccine that remains available to the high-risk population. And nasal spray is another alternative but there will be at most 2 million doses ready for distribution this year. As a result of the shortage, millions of healthy people and even many in the high-risk population will have to forego vaccination. We've been telling people for years now that the flu is not something to take lightly. It's no wonder phones at hospitals, clinics, and doctor's offices have been ringing off the hook this week. Vaccination clinics with shuttered doors do not inspire confidence or trust. People want to know how this happened. They want to know what it means for them and their families. They want to know how we're going to make sure it doesn't happen again. In the short term, coordination and cooperation between federal, state, and local public health providers will be crucial. It will be more important than ever to identify individuals who fall within the high-risk population and ensure that they receive priority. We'll collectively have to grapple with the public's understandable frustration and feelings of helplessness. Preparing for the annual flu season highlights the importance of strong cooperation between different health agencies and private sector companies at all levels. However, this year's vaccine shortage starkly underscores the need to ensure that adequate production capabilities exist. We're not here today to point fingers, but we go into today's hearing already concluding that the current system is flawed. At a committee hearing we held last February, witnesses discussed the possibility of a similar situation unfolding. The committee was concerned that Chiron did not have a manufacturing plant located within the U.S. It was theorized that should a flu pandemic occur, the U.K. could nationalize Chiron's vaccine supply, resulting in the loss of uh, half of the U.S. flu vaccine supply. With only a few vaccine manufacturers producing flu uh, vaccines each year, we concluded then, and we reiterate today, we need to consider what can be done to strengthen the market and increase production capabilities. The current vaccine shortage begs the question, do we need new mechanisms, new incentives to guarantee that an adequate number of safe and effective flu vaccines are produced and delivered annually? Questions continue to mount and hopefully today some will be answered. Why did both Chiron and U.S. officials anticipate that only four to eight million doses would be lost? Why did they not know before Tuesday that a license suspension was possible? Are any of the Chiron doses salvageable? Our witnesses today will discuss the factors contributing to the flu vaccine shortage, how the government and vaccine manufacturers will respond to and manage this crisis, and the steps that must be taken to be prepared for next year's flu season. I know we all share the same goal at the end of the day, a public health system prepared to deal with the annual influenza season. We have a great selection of witnesses today, and I'd like to thank all of them for appearing before the committee, and I look forward to your testimony. I now yield to Mr. Waxman for an opening statement.
Thank let me, you. Let me, uh, let me start and just so I, I know Mr. DeFazio is here uh, from another committee, and I'd ask Yams consent he would be allowed to participate without objection. So ordered. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Davis, for calling this hearing on the critical flu vaccine shortage facing the United States. Three days ago, one of the two major companies providing vaccines in this country announced it would not ship any flu vaccine this year. Just weeks before the start of the flu season, it appears we have lost half of our vaccine supply. As a result, an estimated 40, 40 million Americans who would otherwise have been protected against the flu will not. One key question is how this all could have happened. In late August, the flu vaccine manufacturer Chiron, which has a manufacturing facility in Great Britain, announced that there were potential con contamination problems with several million doses. The company began working with the Food and Drug Administration and British regulators to identify the problem and to ensure the safety of the remaining lot of vaccine. While the company was assuring the public that the problem was under control, and while FDA was reviewing the company's investigation, British regulators sent a team of inspectors that shut the plant down. The British government immediately announced that it had already purchased a backup supply of vaccine that nearly completely offset its reliance on Chiron. In the United States, public health officials appeared to have been taken completely by surprise. After the public announcement, senior FDA officials flew to Britain to determine whether any of Chiron's vaccine could be usable this year. A second key question is what can be done to ensure that the highest risk individuals are vaccinated? The CDC responded instantly to the crisis by issuing new flu vaccine recommendations with priorities for vaccination. But following these recommendations will be an enormous challenge. Some hospitals, clinics, doctors' offices, and state public health departments are scheduled to receive their full order from Aventis, the only major flu vaccine supplier left this year. Other hospitals, clinics, doctors' offices, and public health departments are in, left entirely without the vaccine. It is important to discuss, to discuss what role the public sector can play in overcoming these disparities. While this hearing will, by necessity, focus on the current situation, I hope we can also find time to discuss a third key question. How can we shore up our fragile public health care system? For five years, we have seen a series of expert reports calling attention to major deficits in vaccine supply for both children and adults. In February, our committee heard testimony about the urgent need to improve flu vaccine supply and planning. And just last week, the Government Accountability Office testified before the Senate that, quote, there is no mechanism in place to ensure distribution of flu vaccine to high-risk individuals before others when the vaccine is in short supply. This raises the question of what more can be done to better prepare for possible vaccine delays and shortages in the future. It is long past time for Congress to pay attention to these calls for action. In May, Chairman Davis and I asked the Appropriations Committee to restore cuts and enhance public health funding in the President's budget. Even this minimal request was not granted. Well, I am very pleased that our nation's leading public health officials and other distinguished witnesses have taken the time to testify this morning. We are all indebted to your efforts and eager to hear your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other opening statements? Mr. Micah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've taken a personal interest in this since I came to uh, Congress. Uh, it's nice to talk about uh, some of the effects of, uh, say, a vac vaccine or vaccination that uh, went bad. Uh, my uh, uncle, who's passed away, um, probably partly from a broken heart. Uh, he had two uh, children who uh, were vaccinated and they had uh, uh, adverse reaction. And uh, both of them went into convulsion and uh, 
At the time, they didn't know, but both of them uh, were brain damaged. Uh, both of them are still alive, but they require uh, constant uh, care, and uh, none of them have lived normal lives. So uh, it's something that uh, our family has uh, dealt with. My brother, when he came to Congress, uh, uh, Dan Micah, uh, worked on the va vaccine compensation fund, I think, with Mr. Waxman and uh, Mr. Burton and others who were here. And I took an interest and have tried several times to amend the fund uh, so that it would be more effective. And w w unfortunately, uh, some folks walked away from uh, revising that. But h how did we get here with, uh, with the United States basically basically relying on vaccines, uh, flu uh, vaccines and, uh, and other uh, vaccines uh, to other uh, countries manufacturing. Uh, the number of vaccine manufacturers in the United States has dropped from 20 uh, to only three in the past 15 years, largely as a result of lawsuits filed on behalf of supposed victims. Now everyone has a, everyone has a, can have an adverse reaction. I've, I've got some of my pills here that I take. Uh, some people actually can uh, have an adverse reaction to uh, to aspirin, and uh, some people actually can uh, die from these and do die from these. But one of the major problems is that. Uh, we haven't dealt with the liability question. So we forced the manufacturer uh, overseas or someplace else for the large part. You know, they blame the insurance industry, but insurance uh, industry won't even uh, cover uh, liability in these cases. We blame the drug manufacturers, and they won't manufacture here. Duh, doesn't somebody get it? Go on the web and look, look at... Uh, Get a, try to get a little information on vaccines. Pull, pull up the web, and th this is offensive. The first thing that comes up is a law for, firm, uh, vaccine injury, injury. Sue, sue, sue. So what the hell do you get? Nothing. So we have senior citizens and uh, others uh, put at risk, uh, young uh, and others, because this Congress and others won't uh, change the law. Uh, I'll tell you, it, it really, uh, it's really sad uh, that, uh, and if it was just, if it was just medicine, we're outsourcing the whole production of manufacturing. I come from the business sector. Most of the people here in Congress don't have a clue as to how business operates, but it actually operates. And, uh, making a profit and uh, being able to exist without uh, lawsuits, uh, uh, overly uh, regulated and uh, uh, without uh, oppressive uh, taxation. So we've run them all off, whether it's, you know, we, we don't even produce any ladders in the United States. Vaccines and ladders. <laughs> Why? Uh, because of uh, the field day we've created for uh, trial attorneys. So I'm pretty bitter about it. Uh, uh, this should have been changed a long time ago. We should have changed the liability laws, and we should have uh, changed the vaccine uh, compensation fund so that, so that it works and it does provide compensation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back the balance okay. of my time. Thank you. Any other members wish to make opening statements, Ms. Watson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing so quickly. This is a very disturbing development, and it's very essential to have sufficient doses of flu vaccine available for millions of Americans that are at risk for complications due to the flu. The number of anticipated doses falls far short of the CDC's goal of vaccinating at least 85 million people this year. The CDC guidelines, guidelines to ration the vaccine to high-risk adults, children between 6 and 23 months of age, health care workers, and the elderly is an appropriate response. 
I have concerns about what this means for our national bioterror response system. Yes, I know it's somewhat of a separate issue, but it can get, or we can get so caught off guard with distributing flu vaccine, and are we at risk for similar problems with emergency distributions of antibiotics or vaccines for anthrax or smallpox? I hope the witnesses can address this point. In dealing with this crisis, we must make sure mercury, listed as the mirasol in vaccines, is removed from the dosages of young children. On September 28, 2004, our governor in California, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, signed a bill to sharply restrict the mercury content in vaccines for women and babies. Mercury is a known neurotoxic substance. Mercury inhibits brain function, among other detrimental effects. Children between the ages of 6 and 23 months should not be subject to a substance that we would close down and uh, it, that we would close down a high school for one week after spilling a few of the grams. Manufacturers in the last few years have voluntarily eliminated the mirasol or reduced it to trace elements. The only exception is Avantis Pasteur, who is the sole supplier of flu inoculations for children under two years old. Vaccination is an important health policy for our society, and we have the ability to vaccinate without mercury used as a preservative. In signing the message, Governor Schwarzenegger noted that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended the removal of the Mirasol from childhood vaccines in 1999. So we have a combination of issues here, Mr. Chairman, and we must get to the bottom. I feel that here in our own country, we must support the research on inoculations and vaccinations and the elements that make these potent medicines. And we must see as a policy body that we contribute the necessary resources so that we can develop our own vaccinations without the harmful ingredients that we feel are present at the current time. Thank you so Ms. much. Watson, thank back you my very time. much. Uh, uh, Dr. Burgess, can you comment? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief because I, I do want to hear what our witnesses have to say this morning. And I, I do thank you for convening this hearing. And I thank the witnesses for coming together so quickly. Mr. Micah made the plea about uh, reforming liability as it uh, reflects our vaccine manufacturer in this country. And I just couldn't agree more. I think his <coughs> point was, was extremely important. We forget in this country the the success of vaccine preventable disease. We, we don't see diseases any longer that in my father's and grandfather's generation used to, used to affect hundreds of thousands of, ch of children and adults in this country. The, uh, when I graduated from medical school in 1977, well, the year before, we, uh, we all gathered around a hospital room in Houston because there was a child with diphtheria and no one had seen diphtheria for so long and everyone wanted to make sure that this class of medical students at least saw one case of diphtheria before they graduated. <laughs> uh, it is a tremendous success story that you all have and a story that's not often told. We get distracted by, uh, by words such as outsourcing and thimerosal. I, I urge this panel though to come to some conclusion about what we can do to alter the liability structure in this country so that we're not driving these manufacturing jobs offshore and so that we're not uh, we're not tarnishing the good reputation that what vaccine vaccines have done for this country and what life how much better life is without vaccine preventable diseases in our midst thank you mr chairman thank you very much any other members wish to make up ms norton uh, First, Mr. Chairman, I know we're near the end of this term, but I, I want to thank you and commend you for, for not letting us go home without looking in, into this matter, because I think all over the country uh, there's a serious concern about, uh, uh, we see it in, the, in our own region, the region you and I live in, about entire 
parts of the region whose supply comes from this particular provider and therefore who have no supply. Um, first, I want to say it's a ha I, I, I regard this as kind of a test or trial run. Ms. Watson spoke about bioterrorism. Um, it, ought to, it ought to tell us that uh, the failure to have a backup plan for, for uh, vaccines or medicines that uh, can mean uh, the lives of, of the American people uh, simply must not be allowed to happen again. It seems to me that it's much more serious when it happens uh, with regard to the uh, flu vaccine because it is, it is more likely that flu will take uh, tens of thousands of lives, whereas a bioterrorism attack would probably be contained uh, maybe even to a small facility, who knows? Uh, so I certainly hope this is a, a, a shot across our bow. Uh, for years, there have been difficulties of one kind or the other with respect to the flu vaccine. I, I, I simply want to raise two points. One is the point of science. I look at the science. I'd be interested to know when, how, what we've done in the development of this science where we identify the virus. Apparently, it has to be identified pretty late. Here, it was identified in the late winter or early spring, but then we grow uh, the strains in, um, in chicken eggs. You know, the first thing that occurs to a non-scientist like me is, by now, shouldn't we have some alternative environment that allows us to grow the strains more quickly, especially uh, this country, uh, which has done, I must say, things that seem to me to be far more miraculous than what I have just uh, 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 asked. Uh, secondly, um, the notion of such a major provider, such a major provider of an indispensable vaccine being offshore. Uh, now, if there are liability concerns, we need to bring those out. I think there may be other concerns uh, as well. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about uh, jobs offshore, the or uh, uh, outsourcing, the economic concerns that outsourcing uh, raise, raises. But there's been almost no concern, no talk about uh, what happens when you outsource uh, a major medicine or vaccine that is indispensable to the American people. And I think we, that this crisis forces us to face it. Uh, we, we raise it at the end of the session. I think it, it gives us time to, to follow it through uh, and see whether we have made any, any movement as the new session begins. My third concern is how in the world uh, this um, plant, this operation passed uh, FDA inspection in 2003, and yet the British have to shut down the place. Um, I, I don't understand the difference between uh, the, the regulators in both places. And my fourth concern is apparently the total absence of a backup plan. Uh, everybody knows that tens of thousands of people will die without the vaccine. Everybody knows that, 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 that half the supply was offshore. And here we're sitting here wondering what are we going to do with no backup plan? This is inexcusable. And I think we've got to begin to bring forward something that one, gives us an explanation and two gives us a, ro a, ro a road map to a, a solution in the future. Thank you. Any Thank other you, members Chairman. wish to make opening statements? We'll proceed then to our panel. Uh, very pleased to have a uh, distinguished panel. We have Dr. Julie uh, Gerberding, the director of the CDC, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and Dr. Lester Crawford, acting commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. We're going to discuss efforts being taken at the federal level to respond to the flu vaccine shortage. They will also describe coordination effort with state and local authorities to manage this crisis. As you know, it's our committee's policy. We swear you in. So if you just rise with me and raise your right hand. Um, Solomon, you swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you know the rules. There will be a light on in front of you. It will be green when you start. When it turns orange, uh, that's uh, your four-minute mark. It's red, it's your five minute mark. Uh, we want you to make sure you say everything you want to say, but your entire written testimony is in the record, and uh, we've read that, and the, and the questions will be based on that. So we're just very uh, pleased and honored that you could make time to be here with us today. This is a, 
important and serious crisis, and we know you're working on it. Dr. Gerberding, we'll start with you, and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Chairman Davis, Mr. Waxman, and the committee. We're very happy to be here to give you an uh, update on the current flu situation. On Tuesday morning, I was uh, uh, unhappily awakened by the CEO of Chiron to notify me that we were losing 50 percent of our flu supply this year, um, just as I was preparing to testify for a different House committee. So uh, this has been uh, certainly the top challenge that CDC is facing this week. While we were disappointed to learn this news, we were not entirely unprepared. We have been concerned about vaccine shortages for years. We knew in August that there may be a delay in shipping some doses from this manufacturer, and we are looking at avian influenza uh, throughout Western Asia. So the department has been aggressive in developing the pandemic flu plan. Secretary Thompson and the administration requested $100 million to expand our vaccine supply capability and modernize our vaccine supply capability. Congress provided $50 million this year, and we hope you will support the full $100 million in fiscal year 05. We also have initiated, uh, a first time ever, a stockpile for flu vaccine for children. Uh, we have two and a half million doses in that stockpile, and we're procuring at least two million more doses from Aventus. We also have a stockpile of uh, antiviral treatment and are ex hoping to expand that stockpile imminently. Uh, within hours of the announcement, the secretary conferred with all of the vaccine manufacturer CEOs, uh, and the secretary uh, uh, announce the new recommendations from the Immunization Advisory Committee. These immunization uh, advisory recommendations had actually been developed by CDC as a backup plan for uh, vaccine preparedness when we learned that we may have a shortage this year. So we had undertaken a contingency planning effort at CDC just in case uh, we ended up in this situation. Uh, within hours, we also had a press conference. We communicated through our health alert system to more than uh, 90,000 clinicians and 88 partner organizations who resub, uh, submitted the information to their membership. So we were able to reach hundreds of thousands of clinicians in just a matter of minutes, in part because of the investments in bioterrorism preparedness. Um, within the first 48 hours, the FDA was dispatched to the UK, as you've already mentioned. We've had several more press briefings, conducted media tours, uh, stood up our clinician hotline, and done everything we can to try to communicate the priorities for immunization under this new constrained supply situation. Let me just describe the next steps that we will be taking. First and foremost, we will continue our uh, traditional efforts to monitor flu vaccine, uh, excuse me, flu activity in the United States so that we know where the hot spots are emerging and we can use that as part of our prioritization effort. In addition, we are working with the state and local health officers through ASTO and NHO to assess the current supply of the, uh, vaccine in individual counties as well as the uh, estimated demand for vaccine in those counties. Third, uh, I am working with my colleagues at CDC and the department with the CEO of Aventus Pasteur to develop a distribution plan for the doses of vaccine that have not yet been distributed. I must say that we've had absolutely extraordinary cooperation from Aventus Pasteur, as well as Chiron, who has let us know who their high priority recipients are, uh, the um, people that they had contracted with who were serving the highest priority populations. Uh, unfortunately, for flu vaccine, the government only procures about 10 percent of the total supply, so we have very little independent capacity to modify distribution, and this voluntary effort is something that we are very uh, grateful for. We're also, as I mentioned, taking steps to expand the stockpile and also to expand our capacity to treat and prophylax people with, antiretroviral, with antiviral therapy. And finally, we're, we're asking Americans and clinicians across the country to collaborate with us in this effort. This is really a tough time. There are going to be many frustrated people. Not all people who, receive, who need flu vaccine are going to be able to get it, and we're going to have to work together to do the very best we can to match the supply that we do have with the demand among the people who are the most vulnerable to the serious complications of flu. Again, I really thank you, but I, I also hope that um, this committee and Congress would uh, regard this as a call to action. The situation has gone on far too many years. We continue to have a completely to have a completely fragile vaccine production capability in this country, and it's getting more and more fragile every year. So we need to work together in a bipartisan way with administration and Congress and, and really take the appropriate steps to protect all Americans uh, who are at risk for vaccine pre preventable diseases.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Fauci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. And Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the role of the research component of the Department of Health and Human Services, in this case the NIH, in the vaccine development process, but also in addressing some of the <clears throat> excuse me, problematic issues that we face today with the recent uh, events that have occurred over the past couple of days. If you look over at these posters, this is just a schematic diagram of the role of the research endeavor in influenza vaccine development. All the way to the left is where the academic and NIH community generally concentrates their effort in concept development and early basic research that feeds into and informs the production and development of vaccines that are done in very strong partnership with industry. So of all the endeavors that we engage upon, industry, academic, government collaboration is not only important, it's essential to the ultimate endeavor. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the research endeavors that have occurred and how hopefully this will help us getting to where we want to go. To give you an idea of the depth of the commitment to vaccine research. This is the budget of my institute, the Infectious Diseases Institute, which in 04 was $4.3 billion. As you can see, full 27 percent of all of our resources are directed at vaccine research to the tune of about $1.2 billion. What do we do with that? This poster designates schematically some of the issues that we address directly. We do a, a bit, a little bit, of surveillance and epidemiology. The bulk of this is done extraordinarily well by the CDC. We fundamentally concentrate on basic research and the research capacity to allow us to get to the end game of where we're going, which in this case is diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Just a moment on therapeutics, because we're not specifically talking about that at this hearing, but it's an important component of the armamentarian, the development of new and better drugs to be used as antivirals in influenza. But the questions that was asked by at least a couple of members of the committee, particularly Ms. Norton, when she asked about what we can do about going from the antiquated techniques that we have, there are two among several, but two very important components in vaccine development. One of them is isolating the virus that you're going to be dealing with, providing a seed virus for a pilot lot to start the production. That was generally done in a way that was reliable, but in some respects unpredictable. If you look at the blue virus, that's a tried and true virus that we use all the time in developing vaccines. If this were the virus in question that we were looking to make a vaccine against, you put these together and you hope that over a period of time, weeks or possibly months, but hopefully weeks, they would reassort and recombine to give you the genes expressed of what you want in this one with the other genes here, new techniques developed by NIH grantees called reverse genetics allows us now to take the unpredictability out of this by, by genetic manipulation, taking the genes directly from one of these viruses and taking the genes directly here, put them in a carrier component called a plasmid and directly inserting them into the cell line that you want to make that seed virus in. That's one thing that will take away some of the unpredictability. Importantly, the production has relied, and I think with good results over the years, on egg-based culture systems to grow the virus to make the vaccine. The difficulty with that is that it takes a lot of startup time. Chickens to eggs, eggs are there, you inject the virus in, you make it grow, and it really is cyclic. It's not something that generally goes year-round. We need to gradually move away from that and prove the efficiency of a cell-based culture in which you have more direct control over. If we had that as the major component of influenza, we'd have much more flexibility, speed, and dependability. In fact, on this next slide, this shows the potential advantages of where we want to go with cell culture-based influenza vaccine. It's faster production. It allows a rapid response to the discovery of new and evolving flu strains. It requires less manufacturing space. And this is important. It circumvents possible problems 
that are prevent, presented by highly virulent flu strains such as those that are lethal to chicken embryos and it is tolerated by people with egg allergies. And on this final poster, it shows what we have been doing and the enormous increase over the past couple of years in our influenza research funding, particularly gauged not only at the possibility of the evolution of pandemic flu, but also understanding, as we've heard doc, uh, Dr. Gerberding allude to, the fragility of the system that we and many components of the department would like to address. And hopefully the research component of this will contribute to the speed, the flexibility, and the dependability of the process of influenza vaccine development to allow us to respond better and to anticipate problems such as we're facing today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Crawford. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to assure the members of the committee. Could you, oh, you got a button you can push on. I want to assure the uh, members of the committee and the American public that FDA is very serious about its vaccine safety responsibilities. Influenza vaccine is unique in that the active vaccine ingredients change almost every year, which as a result present new manufacturing challenges. These viruses are continually evolving or mutating, and the recommendations for which viruses to include in the vaccine are based on the surveillance data provided from laboratories worldwide. Early each year, public health experts evaluate the data to determine the strains of virus to include in the influenza virus vaccine administered in the fall. For this reason, it is impossible to stockpile influenza vaccine for use in future years when there may be a shortage due to manufacturing issues. FDA works closely with manufacturers to facilitate the rapid production of influenza vaccine each year. As soon as the strains are recommended, manufacturers begin to grow the virus strains in fertile hen's eggs. These seed strains used by each manufacturer are tested by FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER, to assure that they are the same as the recommended strains and to assure the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Then manufacturers submit the results of their testing along with sample vials from each lot for lot release by CBER. Lot release consists of a review by CBER of the manufacturer's test results for each bulk lot of the vaccine. Finally, manufacturers and CBER perform additional testing prior to distribution to assure the safety and efficacy of these products. FDA inspected Chiron's manufacturing facility in 1999, 2001, and 2003. As is the case with most FDA inspections, FDA investigators identified compliance issues at each inspection. Chiron's corrective measures in response to these deficiencies were reviewed by FDA and found to be adequate. On August 25, 2004, the company informed FDA that they had discovered bacterial contamination in eight lots of the final vaccine product and that Chiron was thoroughly investigating the problem. Chiron was holding all vaccine lots during its investigation and did not release any of the product. Throughout September, FDA, CDC, and Chiron had weekly conference calls to discuss the status of the investigation. Chiron informed FDA that they had identified the cause of the contamination and it was limited to specific lots. The company indicated to FDA that there were, was no evidence that any other lots were affected. But nonetheless, they were retesting all final lots. Chiron later informed FDA that results of the testing were negative. The company indicated that they were going to submit their final report on the investigation this week and a call was scheduled for Tuesday. FDA had no knowledge of the British decision to suspend the firm's UK license to manufacture flu vaccine prior to being informed by the relevant agency from the UK this week. Dr. Jesse Goodman, director of CBER and a team of senior scientific and compliance officials met with FDA's counterpart yesterday in the UK to gain further understanding of their action. Today, they are meeting with Chiron officials on site in England and will begin an inspection of the company's manufacturing facility over the weekend. During that inspection, they will be joined by uh, two senior inspection officials from the UK. Clearly, the loss of this vaccine poses a serious challenge. However, it is important to remember that we have faced influenza shortages in the past. 
We work with our HHS colleagues, health officials, and manufacturers on how to best use the limited supply. For example, Aventis Pasteur has indicated to FDA that they will provide an additional 1 million doses, increasing their total number of available doses to 55.4 million. Nonetheless, this is still well below last year's supply of 87 million doses. We're encouraging people to take advantage of the Metamune flu mist vaccine. Flu mist is recommended for healthy individuals 5 to 49 years of age and therefore provides an option for those who would not receive vaccine under CDC's priority vaccine, uh, vaccine guidelines. Metamune anticipates having 1 to 2 million doses of flu mist available this year. Now, in the future, we must create more efficient ways to produce flu vaccines so we can better deal with shortages or unexpected problems. In each of the past two budgets, the Department has requested $100 million to shift vaccine development to new cell culture technologies, as well as to provide for year-round availability of eggs for egg-based vaccine. We received $50 million in the FY04 budget for this activity and urge Congress to fully fund the $100 million request in the fiscal year 05 budget. FDA has also been investing its energy and resources in important initiatives such as the current good manufacturing practices for the 21st century, known as the CGMP initiative, and the Critical Path initiative. These activities will also help increase the availability of vaccines and other medical products. It is imperative uh, that we invest in a more efficient, reliable, and modern method for producing influenza vaccine. With adequate supply and widespread immunization, the morbidity and mortality from influenza can be markedly reduced. Once again, I thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to the rest of the hearing. Well, thank you all very much. We may be expecting votes uh, in, in the 11 o'clock uh, time frame. We give us about 25 minutes, about five rounds here. I'm going to start, um, uh, Dr. Eberling. Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia are all heavily dependent on Chiron to supply vaccines for the public sector. Is the CDC exploring the option of acquiring the undelivered event as flu zone doses, which I think is about 20 million, and then distributing it to states that contracted slowly with, uh, just solely with Chiron? Thank you. The CDC is working with Aventus to look at the undistributed doses of vaccine. Of those, certain doses are considered to be very high priority. For example, those needed for force protection or for populations that we know are extremely high risk. And so the Aventus will be certainly honoring their contracts in that regard. A small number of doses have not been sold. CDC is hoping to purchase those or work with Aventus to assure that they are used in the highest priority areas. And then there are doses in the middle, some of which go to high priority populations such as nursing homes. Uh, and we are also working with Chiron because we uh, have gotten the information about where the unmet high priority contracts are. Right now, it appears that we will be able to honor all public sector uh, requests for vaccine purchase. I don't want to commit to that today, but it looks very promising. And we will be announcing the uh, overall uh, supply plan early next week after we're sure that we've accounted for uh, the parts of the geographic distribution that are most vulnerable right now. This is not going to be perfect, uh, and we are still going to have to rely on prioritization. When we issued the uh, guidelines this week, we were very careful to refer to them as interim guidelines, knowing as we got more information about where the demand is, where the supply is, and where the flu is, we may have to even make those recommendations uh, more or less stringent. The, the priorities right now would be as you would rank them. Pardon? Who, what would be the priority? Seniors? Yeah, absolutely. HIV? People who are 65 years of age and older at the very highest risk for uh, hospitalization and death due to flu, so they are the highest priority. Children between the ages of six months and 23 months are also a high priority because they have a disproportionate hospitalization rate and are at some risk of death. Anybody with an underlying medical condition is at risk, so they are included in the prioritization risk. And then there are people who have uh, uh, caretakers of individuals in those other groups. So uh, because they might spread flu to somebody else, they are included in the priority list right now. Most of those people are well, and some of them certainly could qualify for flu mist. So uh, we would like to uh, emphasize uh, the comment about using flu mist for those people who are otherwise healthy and between the ages of 5 and 49. Dr. Fauci, I've heard someone suggest that uh, 
because of the shortage, uh, discussions on the possibility of diluting the vaccine doses in order to double the supply. Is that a possibility, uh, or would there be a need for clinical trials beforehand? Or yeah, well, that's based on a study that was performed uh, through the NIH funding at six institutions throughout the country from the 2000-2001 vaccine trivalent vaccine. Uh, what it did was look at a thousand individuals and give half of them a half a dose and the other half a full dose, and it was found that although the full dose gave more of a measurable response that you would correlate with protection, there was not substantially difference, suggesting that in time of dire need, you might be able to do that. These data are available. Uh, the NIH has a couple of days ago submitted it to the FDA, and it's something that at least needs to be considered. There's certainly no decision or no promise that we can be able to do that, but depending upon how things unfold, it's something we'll at least have on the table to look at. And this, importantly, could only be used in individuals who are the healthy adults, because the study was done in that group of individuals. Dr. Crawford, um, I understand FDA currently has a team of scientists and researchers in Liverpool meeting with Chiron. We appreciate your, the proactivity there. Are, do you think any of the Chiron fluviron doses are salvageable? And <laughs> legally, what can you do? Because I understand there are some doses that are in the United States. It's not, not possible to say if any of them are sal salvageable at this point. Uh, the inspection of the uh, facility itself and uh, the, the uh, examinations that are, would be attended upon that sort of conclusion will begin tomorrow. Uh, the meetings with the Chiron officials are going well, as they did with the MHRA people yesterday. But um, I, I have to present to you a, a pessimistic point of view of whether or not we can clear any of these. As you know, they are contaminated uh, with a bacterium in the gram-negative range, and it is not um, clear to me whether or not we can or not. I'd like to be able to say that there is some optimism. Um, and there is the possibility, and we'll consider this on a risk-based evaluation. My time's up, but just before I ask, I want to just ask one last question. What steps are we taking with Chiron to make sure they're going to be able to produce vaccines next year? Because right now, they, they're kind of under a debarment suspension. Yes. we are. Um, we are meeting with the MHRA, and they have pledged to work with us. That's our the regulatory com, um, counterpart in uh, the UK. And uh, so I think together um, they're on the ground, and we're also on the ground. And uh, I think we can work with them to, uh, to bring them forward. We, frankly, will have to provide some technical service, as we often do, to vaccine manufacturers. And uh, I, I would be optimistic about that prospect. Um, what I am concerned about is that these kinds of events um, often result in a further consolidation of the industry. The lack of competition in that industry is something that we've testified about before, but that worries me a great deal. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, evidently, in August, we had some idea that there was a contamination possible of the supply from uh, Chiron uh, that was the vaccine that was being produced in Great Britain. And uh, the British knew about it, and they went out and made arrangements immediately to make sure they had the full supply for their needs. Obviously, their needs are less than ours. And secondly, they have other companies they can go to other than the two that we have to rely on. Dr. Gerberding, uh, our system is so fragile, and contingency planning is so important. What happened in August when you first heard about the possible shortage, what actions did uh, CDC take? The, the initial contingency plan was to assume worst case scenario that we wouldn't get vaccine from Chiron and then identify what is the most restricted number of people who must get vaccine. And that is about 50 million people based not only on the numbers in the high risk groups, but on patterns of uh, requests for vaccination that we've observed in previous years. So, for example, in 2002, uh, through our National Health Interview Survey, 
we recognize that um, of the people who should have been receiving vaccine, what proportion actually were va vaccinated, and we could extrapolate that uh, into the current year and make a guess at how many people were likely to request vaccine if these patterns held up. That was about 50 million people, give or take, several million depending on the demand and the severity of the flu season. So that was the first step. But it's also very important to remember that by August, vaccine was already under contract. We only have access to about 10% of the total supply and we had procured what we could for the stockpile with the $40 million appropriation that we had to do that. So we had no flexibility to go to a different manufacturer and buy vaccine right. because they'd already sold it. Now, Chiron, uh I mean, uh, Aventus, which is now the only company that's supplying this vaccine, has its own contracts. They have contracts with clinics, but they also have contracts with the private sector. Do you, do you know, and more importantly, do the state and local people that run the vaccination programs know to whom they are selling the, con uh, the vaccine, to whom they've already delivered it, and whether there can be some redirection either of, of the existing supply that's already been distributed or the, that part of the supply that's yet to be distributed so that you can make a determination that the prioritization schedule is going to be met. Vaccine manufacturers consider that information proprietary and we have no legal authorization to demand it. However, we have been able to develop an arrangement with Aventus Pasteur where we are getting that information to the county level, which I think is a, 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 a very reasonable approach so that the county health officers or the local health officers, the state health officers can see, you know, uh, for our population, we have a very large imbalance or we're doing okay or no shortages are reported. Um, we're hoping that that will help us map out the patterns that we need to address with the reallocation of the remaining doses. And I, I think it's commendable that we're even talking about a manufacturer being willing to uh, deflect some doses of vaccine from people who are expecting to receive it to meet the highest priority demand. So this is voluntary. It's very difficult. Um, there is no mapping of vaccine supply authority in this country, but we'll do the best we can. Is there any mapping or knowledge within the county of who has the vaccine and who does not? Uh, the county uh, health officials as well as state health officials have been surveying their members. Um, the first survey to come out of the National Association of City and County Health Officers indicates that uh, all of the jurisdictions are making an attempt to map uh, availability within their jurisdiction and they're certainly able to know what they have in the, pri in the public sector, but some private sector participants are not willing to disclose the amount of vaccine they have. Uh, we sense that there's probably some hoarding going on and people are waiting to make sure that their uh, patients or their customers are served first. Well, you could ask Aventus to give you that information. They don't have to, but you could ask for it, couldn't you? We have asked for it, um, and the uh, one caveat is that uh, some of the vaccine is purchased, for example, by a large drugstore, and then they redistribute it yeah. across the United States. So we don't have a one-to-one -one mapping of exactly where the doses of the vaccine are. Uh, Dr. Crawford, uh, in August, uh, Chiron announced several million doses of its flu vac vaccine might have been contaminated by bacteria. Um, the British regulators immediately sent out an inspection team to review the manufacturing standards at the facility. FDA did not. Was FDA aware that this extensive review by British regulators were, were, was going on, and why did FDA not conduct its own investigation of the facility? And is there a communication between the British uh, equivalent of the uh, FDA with you so that you know what they're uh, up to and, and uh, you can communicate uh, freely and respond? Actually, when those conclusions were reached, um, we did have uh, uh, inspectors in the plant from the United States. Uh, they were in Liverpool at the time on August 25, and they did review the records. It looked like at that point um, the maximum uh, number of lots that might be turned down was something less than 10 percent. Um, we, we arranged, uh, in cooperation with the Centers for Disease Control, and a weekly conference call to see what progress they were making. The United Kingdom did uh, the same thing. Um, and, and so what happened is, is that we obviously hoped for the best. It was too late on August 25 to start a new uh, cycle of uh, vaccine production because uh, that's a six-month enterprise, as we mentioned earlier. 
Uh, but we hope for the best. We gave them all we could in terms of uh, help, as did the British. And uh, I, th I think um, uh, it's fair to say that our final conference call with them, where we would have reached a go or no go decision, was on the same day that the British announced. Uh, the time differential made us a few hours behind. I was uh, in a meeting in Geneva with one of the um, officials of the MHRA who uh, told me about the situation very early in the morning and um, also revealed that they would be, they would have 20 percent less vaccine in England than they had anticipated needing. Uh, their, their level of vaccination is not as great as ours, so they didn't have quite as much of an impact. But that's the situation. Could I just ask you one question, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you permit? Could you contrast the uh, FDA review with the British review? They seem to be much more involved in FDA, and you, you were looking at the records, but they were already inspecting the, the plant. Is that a fair statement? Uh, no, actually, we were in the plant on August 25, so I, I think it was about the same thing. About the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Burgess. Yes, do Dr. Crawford, um, following the same line of questioning that Mr. Waxman was taking, was there, was there some evidence that the the British equivalent of the FDA had that that was more compelling than the evidence that, that you had? Because it does seem that their decision was was different, and you have to wonder if the data that was presented to both was, was consistent. The, the decision day, which was Tuesday of this week, uh, was the same for the British as it was for the U.S. Uh, they did have a meeting on Friday when they considered options, uh, but their final decision uh, was not announced until um, Tuesday after a further meeting on Monday afternoon and into the night. Uh, so I would say um, the availability of information was the same with the, the two governments. So the data presented was the same and the conclusion reached was, was identical with the two, in, two agencies? Yes. Are you at liberty to, to tell us what bacteria is involved in the contamination? Yes, it's um, one called Serratia maricescens. It's so gram negative, as you know, related to Klebsiella and uh, Enterobacter. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Gerberding. Last year, we we of course saw headlines about the shortage of the flu vaccine and how it, that affected some of the youngest patients in this country. What, there was, I assume, a contingency in place for this year if there was a a similar bad actor from the from the flu standpoint, where there was a run on the vaccine as we saw last year. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. We actually had expected a record number of doses of flu vaccine to be produced this year, in part to uh, allow more surge than we had last year, and in part because we had added the recommendation for children between the ages of 6 and 23 months to be immunized. Um, last year, uh, 87 million doses of vaccine were manufactured, 83 million doses were administered. This year we had anticipated 100 million, even with the loss of the 6 to 8 million doses from Chiron based on their projections, uh, we still anticipated we would have more vaccine than last year. Um, but nevertheless, we're, I'm a pragmatic South Dakotan and I um, always prepared for the worst case scenario and when you know that some doses are contaminated even though all testimony, the uh, CEO of Chiron was here uh, a week ago testifying they expected full delivery in October. He met with the secretary, expected full delivery in October. So we were prepared for the delay, but in the background we had a backup plan in case the worst case thing happened and indeed it did. And, and do you think that preparation that you undertook last year, perhaps it's fair to say that that's going to blunt some of the, uh, the potential trouble that's going to accrue from, from the loss of the, the British vaccine? It's very helpful that Aventus production was higher this year than last year um, for several reasons. They tried to make more, but also the vaccine yield was very good, so uh, we were able to get a few more doses from Aventus Pasteur than I think they had initially projected um, several months ago. Uh, the opposite issue is that flu mist, which um, went unsold last year, only made 1.5 million doses this year instead of the 4.5 some doses last year. So we lost that opportunity to use uh, the nasal vaccine for the healthy people who aren't 
uh, in the priority list for this year under the shortage conditions. So again, this is, this is a, flu is always unpredictable, but the demand for flu vaccine is equally unpredictable. And what we need is a robust surge capacity so that when demand exceeds supply, we have some place to go to fill in the gaps. And we just simply do not have that surge. Do you feel you have the, the pieces in place to make certain that the healthier members of the community understand that, that they need to use the, uh, the intranasal flu? We are, we are engaged in uh, our full communication system at CDC, so we are reaching out directly to consumers in those age groups. We are reaching out to employers across the business community. I have been interacting with the National Business Group on Health, and they have um, blasted information out to their memberships. We're working with uh, stakeholder groups from our employee sector through NIOSH and other parts of CDC. Uh, we're also engaged as we speak. Several CDC people are doing radio tours. We're setting a satellite uplink up so that we can blast out through those mechanisms. We've done several press briefings already and we'll continue to try to uh, use that venue for outreach. Um, our next uh, emphasis will be on translating this information into all relevant languages so that people in all communities will have it. Our, we're setting up an 800 number so that people who cannot find vaccine have a place to call or people who are confused about whether they need vaccine or not have a place to call to get that information from CDC. We'll be mapping those calls by district and by, by county and then we will use that information as a helpful input to the local health officials to recognize uh, supply demand mis mis mismatches in their community. So these activities are all ongoing, uh, a lot of effort made to communicate, but with any public health uh, situation of this magnitude and as challenging as this one is, it's, uh, you can never communicate enough. So we will continue to look for every opportunity to try to shape people's decision in a way that allows us to get the people who need vaccine the most vaccinated. Dr. Fauci, you, you mentioned the, the funding difference between the 100 million yeah. that would help you go to a, uh, a, a, a cell culture technology. Uh, if you got that funding today from this Congress, that $60 million shortfall was, was made up, how, how quickly could we expect to see the, the end result? I think we'd be able to in implement it almost immediately in that what we want, there, there are two components to that additional amount that the department have asked for. One is to provide a guaranteed year-round availability of eggs for egg-based culture, and the other is to push the envelope on the development of the cell-based culture. Since research is already ongoing on the cell-based culture, not only through our grantees and contractors, but the companies themselves are now starting to phase some of that in, the money, as it becomes available, will literally hit the ground running in making this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. Mr. Kandorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a little, just, you know, being a total layman, sitting back and listening, it just seems to me that you're testifying that we're involved in a crapshoot with vaccines. And it could, if there had been contamination at a dentist, we would be without uh, a vaccine in the country and have no capacity to produce it. And I, I can understand that, but I, I can't figure out that there is a definite plan that until you get the new technology in place, which should take probably five to seven years, this could happen next year, could happen the following year, and there's, there's no methodology in place other than it sounds like you have a great informative thing after the occurrence to notify people who can't get the vaccine. My question is, what do we have that, uh, to protect that next year this won't happen, and what can we do or what role should the government play with the private sector to try and insulate the United States from this? Thing? I'm not hearing whether we should have duplicate manufacturing facilities, separate manufacturing facilities, on-site constant inspection when critical decisions will be made if there's a contamination problem. And this is just a contamination problem. It could have been a terrorist problem. Now, you are absolutely right that we are vulnerable to failures in the manufacturing process. We have known this for more than a decade. In the years 2000 to 2003, we saw this problem come up over and over again with childhood immunizations. 
and we need more manufacturing capability and we need more manufacturers of these vaccines. Doctor, aren't we involved in a terrorism war or am I missing something in the last three years? I, I don't, I seem to hear you testifying like we're in any age that we could have been in the 80s, the 90s, and that vaccines and responding to uh, bacteriological problems seem to, should be one of our highest priorities. And, and can you tell me what I agree uh, with Department you that of Security, Homeland Security, and this government has done in the last three years to make sure that this eventuality that now has occurred shouldn't have occurred or we could, should have had a backup plan in anticipation of it? I agree with you completely. We have been trying to make a strong case for the fact that influenza is a public health threat and it deserves that, macro that, investments. Doctor, that's a given, that that's important. 100 million people, we're, we're, we're talking about something where probably half a million people may die that wouldn't have died or a quarter of a million people will die that wouldn't have died if they had the vaccine. Is that probable? In an average year, 36,000 people die from influenza. Okay. So we, we can't can predict whether this year will be a severe flu right. season then, or a mild th season. Then we could say that because we're only going to have half the dosage likelihood is we, we may suffer 18,000 additional deaths or at least 5,000 or something. We're, we're going to have people really die and as many or more people than died in the World Trade Center. Yeah, and let, let, me, let me say again, every year, even with an adequate vaccine supply, people die from flu because we don't get Doctor, everybody who needs vaccine any treated. Are more people likely to die in the United States because of this contamination that otherwise wouldn't have died if we had adequate vaccin uh, vaccination capacity? I don't know, but I'm worried about it. Well, what, what, you, I mean, you, you have no professional opinion that you can project ahead of the likelihood because maybe we shouldn't spend anything on vaccination if we can use half the production and we don't need the whole, then we obviously don't need that protection out there. Now, there must be some mathematical scale that this is really a life-death issue. It and is a life-and-death issue. I agree with you completely. Okay. And we, now, we the, cannot... And I'm, not, I'm not condemning your organization or any of the three there at the table, other than we're three years into the war on terrorism, and it doesn't sound to me and I'm not condemning your agencies. You were asking for money. You were asking for preparation. I have visited these manufacturing facilities. They have called my attention to the fact that they don't know what will happen in this country in a pandemic and how we're going to respond to it. Have you presented to the Congress and to the President a plan to meet terrorism and pandemics? And have we responded to it? Well, as we said, we requested resources to scale up the surge capacity for vaccine from Congress last year. Secretary Thompson, the administration, requested $100 million. Congress appropriated $50 million. We've asked for the opportunity to expand the vaccine stockpile so that we could purchase a reserve. We are making right. progress toward achieving that, but we haven't had the full appropriation to accomplish that yet. So this Congress has failed to respond to the agencies of the, uh, of, of the executive department of this government that would have been a response to Homeland Security because we are, do not have the capacity, potentially, to meet the biological uh, uh, protections against biological warfare. Is that correct? As I said, we requested $100 million. We received 50. We're hoping Congress will support the full $100 million in the fiscal year 05. Thank you. That was part of the omnibus last year, which, uh, all right. Um, Mr. Souter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd like to just add my voice to the many others that Dr. Gerberding, I hope next time the network does a TV show, they give you full credit. Uh, your agency uh, deserves the credit for the uh, work that you do. Um, uh, based on um, uh, the conversations I've heard here, I want to ask you a couple questions. My colleague from Indiana, Senator Bai, uh, nearly a, a year ago, introduced legislation that sounds to me like it attempts to address some of the things that you raised. It, one of the things that Dr. Crawford raised was a seeming lack of competition in the marketplace. One of the things there would be to encourage, uh, through investment credit, more people to get into the business. Uh, do you think that would help at all? What, what do you think is the biggest stumbling block? And uh, I would appreciate a further comment on that because another, and let me add this, and we'll start with Dr. Crawford and, and, and move through. Uh, a second part of the legislation 
uh, uh, deals with trying to make sure that the government buys or, or if, if the market doesn't meet, the government will back up and purchase a larger supply so we have a backup supply. It's not without precedent. For example, I remember working as a, a staffer with MRE companies because uh, we have these pulses in ready-to-eat meals uh, and at wartime. So part of the goal had been to keep two or three of these companies in business so that when we had a pulse, we had the capability to do that. How do you feel uh, about wh what impact on the market would that have uh, if we had a backup guarantee if the production rate were higher? Because So one question is, is, can we get more people in through an investment credit? Do you think that would actually stimulate? Second, would, would having some backup guarantee for the high-risk population that guaranteed if they produced it like Flumis did and didn't get backed up? And then my last question along the same lines is, Flumis is going to testify people manufacture that in the next panel that they had to cut back because the market didn't do it. They're restricted at the areas that in effect the government backs up um, and that we're losing manufacturers. Uh, so what if it isn't those two things that I mentioned earlier would you do to try to get more manufacturers in the business? Yeah, yeah what, what we're trying to do, uh, we, as you know, we don't have funding for like startup companies or that sort of thing, we basically regulate them. We're the, the bad news for them rather than the good news generally. What we are trying to do, though, is to improve our processes so that um, we create a favorable regulatory environment for more companies to get involved. I mentioned uh, the good manufacturing practices, which we've just announced after a two-year study. Um, and what this would do would make it uh, more it would be a newer approach to manufacture. It, it would be less onerous, it would be more scientific, more systematic. And over time, along with a, a new research initiative that we're working with the National Institute of Health on called the Critical Path, uh, we believe that uh, it will make a more, not only a more predictable climate for vaccine manufacturers, but one that produces better products with more certainty of uh, success. Uh, in, in the lots that we have now, I mentioned earlier that eight out of 100 were originally considered to be defective. We, as we go through our examination tomorrow, uh, this will actually be a test case. We don't know how many are or, or if any are badly contaminated until we do the inspection. But certainly a better regulatory environment where it's more modernized, uh, we, we, we take a, a newer approach at it would help. And that's what we're committed to. Uh, Dr. Fasha, I know, I know I completely agree that the regulatory environment and all kinds of, of things is uh, a deterrent and certainly all the manufacturers say that. Uh, to some degree, we've only been able to move that slightly. I hope we continue to move that and yet keep people's uh, health safe. The question is also, is there a tipping point here where a small investment or even a medium investment tax credit or uh, would, say, impact these new technologies or if we uh, in effect, backed up some of the purchases for pulse components, uh, Dr. Fosche. Yeah. Uh, you bring up an extraordinarily important point that has many ramifications for what has been said thus far today about, as we keep referring to as the fragility of the vaccine uh, development industry, the pharmaceutical industry. And, and I think it boils down to things that we in the department at, at all three of our agencies have been facing. And that is a, a real lack of a climate of incentivization to get companies involved. People ask, well, well how come you only had two companies involved with the, uh, the uh, uh, killed vaccine for influenza? Those are the only two companies that were licensed in this country to make and, and distribute. So it isn't as if we had 15 companies and we only decided on two. And I think that's something that sometimes gets uh, misunderstood. The other issue is if you look at the climate of how we look at uh, vaccine development, it's very risky business for a company to get involved. Risky because of the profit margin, risky because you're dealing with biologics. And biologics are much more difficult to predict the success of it. And then there's the issue of the use of a vaccine, which is used once or twice or three times in a person's lifetime, as opposed to the other possibility of the same company developing a blockbuster drug that a, someone would use every day of their lives for the rest of their lives that they could make millions at. So what we've been trying to do is to try and do everything from regulatory incentives to research by pushing the envelope more, to take away some of the risks by the 
by the, uh, 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 the approaches that I showed in my opening statement about perfecting things like the reverse genetics or perfecting things like the use of cell culture based. And then finally, it's the issue of pricing and how our culture views how much was one is willing to pay for a vaccine. I, uh, this morning in preparation for the hearing, I, I, I got on the phone in my office very early and I called up the pharmacy in, in Bethesda and I, I asked about the relative prices of things because we talk about it a lot. And I asked them what would be the retail price of a year's supply of Lipitor, which is a blockbuster cholesterol lowering drug, $1,608. What would be the yearly cost of a 50 milligrams of Viagra, $3,500 a year per person. What's the cost of the Aventus Pasteur vaccine? Seven to $10. So you're talking about the idea of, a, of, of any company wanting to go towards something that has a major profit margin. So we need to help with incentives. We could do it research-wise, we could do it regulatory-wise, but it's a rather broad, generic issue that we hope working with the committee that we'll be able to find some solutions to that. Thank Doctor, you very much. Could, could I have see if Dr. Gerberding has anything to add? Sure. I, I would just add that in the short run, before we are able to scale up and using some of the tools you've described, that the backup plan of government purchasing additional doses of vaccine is one that we're already doing on a small scale, and it is conceivable that by expanding that, manufacturers would be incentivized to make as much vaccine as they could. The downside of that is that taxpayers would have to be prepared that most years we'd throw vaccine away and it would be a waste of tax dollars. So there is a trade-off there, um, with flu vaccine at least, because we have to get a new vaccine preparation every year. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Watson. Your question. Your question. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Consulting with my expert here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Crawford, does the Fed Food and Drug Administration pretty much agree with the determination made by the British health authorities? We won't. Uh, I can't answer that until we get through with our inspection. We're looking at the lots and uh, hoping for the best, uh, but there's an air of pessimism, so okay. probably we will. Um, Dr. Gerberling, what are we doing or is anything being done about the prospect of price gouging? We are concerned about price gouging. We saw this last year as well. Um, the first step is to identify where it's happening, and the second step is to alert the local and state health officials that it's happening in their jurisdiction and also the FTC, um, who has the regulatory responsibility to evaluate and, and take the appropriate steps. I think it's tragic. Uh, we know in any uh, market where there's a shortage of, of product that there's a tendency to raise the price, but these are unfair price increases and they really add insult to injury. Are you satisfied that our, um, our officials are actually out there working on this issue? You've given a proper notice to people and... Uh, I don't have an answer for that today. We're just 48 hours into this, but we would definitely be looking for it and we will also make our hotline available if there are reports of this so that people can alert us and we can pass the information on to the appropriate response agencies. Thank you. Dr. Fauci, you, you should have slept over last night. You were here yesterday on the uh, West Nile virus. Doctor, uh, with respect to our research, uh, MedImmune, for one, says that they're developing vaccines for uh, and giving it for free to the government inspectors or uh, researchers or whatever, but they obviously charge others who create a profit eventually from it for that. Do we need to address our patent laws at all to make sure that uh, enough people have access to the rever uh, reverse uh, genetics processes or anything, or is it fine the way it is? Um, I think what you're referring to is, is uh, what's going on is a dispute about the pattern of the reverse exactly. genetics. I'm not so sure that we really need to address the patent laws on that. We just need to clarify pretty quickly what the patent issues are involved there so we can get the ball rolling on this and not having it caught up. But I don't think this is a generic patent law problem. Now, a moment ago, you were talking about the different prices that you get for different prescription drugs. The fact of the matter is, it's not the government that's keeping the price on the flu uh, vaccines low, is it? I mean, we don't set the price and keep it low? Well, or, actually not, but one of the issues we face, and what I was referring to is not that it's the government or industry. No, no, the I know, but I, I guess of, I'm getting of, to the fact the, is, yeah. the fact it's a market situation. It, it's, it's the culture. Right. It, it's the culture of people feeling, and maybe in some respects appropriately so. But, but it is the market, because if people 
made more of a demand for it, and the price could be raised right. higher. If it's raised higher, they're afraid people won't buy it at the higher price now. Or, or we're not sure, but also maybe the third-party payers wouldn't necessarily pay it. That's the point. That's, I think, an important issue. Right. So uh, you know, one of the things, I, I think Dr. Poland, Gregory Poland, who from the Mayo Clinic, gave the options out there. Either we have to subsidize or give incentives to manufacturers to get them into the business, or the government has to own or operate either themselves or through a contract or a plan to produce the vaccine. Seems to lay out some of the options, as you say, everywhere from regulation to doing it yourself on that. But as long as we leave it entirely without any regulation to the industry, we get the lower prices, we get less demand, and we get two manufacturers instead of more, and, and it creates a problem in there. Is anybody in either, any of these agencies that are before us right now debating this issue about, uh, as a policy matter, whether the government ought to either have a contractor get in there and somehow subsidize them to, to create this or get in the business themselves or regulate the price or something? Is that discussion going on at all, Doctor? Uh, that discussion is certainly going on. It's been going on for some time. Just on Monday, the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, who has responsibility for advising the department and the government on those issues, issued some statements that recommended that we look at those options that you just mentioned. Um, I think that it's, there's not a long list of, of options, and we need to bite the bullet here and come up with a plan. I mean, I, you know, just this absolute free market aspect when it comes to health care doesn't always seem to fit the same model as if you're selling widgets. You know, health care is, is such a different item here, and we get that right across the spectrum of health care issues. This one brings it into even stronger relief. Uh, and I know that everybody's paranoid of the word regulation or uh, any government involvement, but we do expect the government to step forward for our safety and for our protection in different instances, and I hope that debate accelerates. And I think Congress, uh, Mr. Chairman, ought to be involved in that debate itself, and there may be some further hearings on this, uh, away from the ideology of it or whatever, to what's the practical matter of how do we take care of health concerns. And that may mean a little less of the absolute free market and some more intervention here so that we make sure that we have this product available. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Micah. Thank you. I remember uh, previous hearings on the subject of the costs of uh, some of these vaccines, and I remember uh, someone holding up a, a flu, well, a, a vaccine a vial, and uh, in that testimony, they uh, said that the cost of the vaccine itself was uh, less than a dollar, around a dollar, I don't remember. But uh, if you could get insurance, uh, uh, the cost was like about 20 20 some dollars. I don't know if that's still the case. Is that uh, typical ratio, uh, Dr. Fauci? I, I, I think you were talking about some of the costs. I, I'm not actually uh, sure, and I would hesitate to make any definitive statement about the relative cost of the liability insurance that they would have to pay. So Are they having trouble getting it, manufacturers? Isn't, uh, I didn't hear you cite yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I heard you cite some incentives, yeah. but isn't that one of the major problems, the most significant problems to manufacturing in the United States? Um, you know, I, I'd best leave that for the companies to answer, but I know that when you're dealing with childhood vaccines, we do have a childhood vaccine fund for yes. compensation. No, but, uh, it's I not mean, in the adult. Yeah. Uh, right now, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, bl blaming the sort of the bureaucrats. Now, you all haven't paid enough attention to this. Uh, uh, and uh, there'll probably be horrible things like price gouging because the supply is down. You had a responsibility to, and uh, it was kind of interesting, someone on the other said you had to fly. Did, who, who flew over to check it? Was that FDA? FDA. Yeah. FDA? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had to fly to Europe to check the uh, supply. I'm sure there's a lot, uh, I'm sure it's much more beneficial to manufacture this outside the United States right. and keep an eye on it. Uh, and. I understand you have an annual inspection? Or yeah, it uh, it's depending on what the risk is expected to be. It can be as little as every two years. How many did we have here uh, at, the, at the site that was, went bad? Uh, we we uh, were there in August. Can you August. supply uh, okay, the rec a record of your visit? Yes, the, absolutely. For Thank the, you. For the committee. Um, this is a research and development budget uh, for the uh, National Institute here, and it, uh, it says vaccine research, uh, we supply $1.18 billion in research. Uh, Mr. Sanders and I, so, uh, several years ago, went over and met with some of the drug manufacturers trying to figure out why, uh, 
why, what was happening in the marketplace. At that time, they told us there was no R&D in Europe, that it was all being done in the United States uh, for most drug development and, and vaccines. Is that still the case? Does anybody know? You're talking about for pharmaceuticals? Yes. Yeah, 63% uh, of the profit, it is reported, from pharmaceuticals worldwide is gained through U.S. sales. So quite naturally, they, but, they try to develop no, drugs. I, we were told, quite frankly, that there's no real R&D going on there, or very limited. Almost all of it comes from the United States. So the United States uh, taxpayers are financing R&D in, in vaccines and other pharmaceuticals. And then we're outsourcing that because you can't manufacture in the United States because you get your butt sued. Uh, uh, and uh, you all also certify, don't you, or uh, do you approve the drugs? F FDA approves those, um, those vaccines, right? You yes, we do. Seal of approval. Well, you know, I think it's time we looked at some system where uh, we took responsibility and there'd be plenty of uh, drugs available at low cost if we limited the liability. If we set up some funds for decent compensation for victims, uh, whether it's a pharmaceutical or whether it's a vaccine. Uh, wouldn't that be a better solution, uh, Dr. Fusi? Um, I you, think the idea of compensation is something that needs to be... Well, we, we've done some of it with yeah. the children's immunization. Right, exactly. Okay. That, that? But looking at a broader picture for a va vaccine, we, we produce it. Our responsibility is to have an agency like FDA yeah. to say that this is a good dr yeah. drug. Now, we force the manufacturing outside. We're paying for the R&D, uh, and... Uh, it, it would behoove us to manufacture yeah. that in the United States, have better yeah. control, uh, and, and we're certifying it, whether it's manufactured in the United States or outside, uh, that it's uh, good. So shouldn't we have some of that responsibility, FDA? Yes, yes, okay. we should. Okay, right. thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired, Ms. Norton. Be the last uh, questioner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Look, having been caught without a backup plan already, uh, I, I'm, I'm really compelled, uh, Dr. Gerberling, to ask uh, uh, what is the backup plan in case the volunteer sharing um, doesn't work up. Now, you know, the most generous people in the world are health care people, so I'm sure everybody is doing what, what, they, uh, uh, what you'd expect them to do. What are you empowered to do if, in fact, your, quote, backup volunteer plan proves as insufficient as having no backup plan for half the supplies which now are unavailable. What are you empowered to do? What would you do if, in fact, people begin to make their own, uh, to, to make their own assessments, particularly since the private sector controls most of the supply? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. That, that's an important distinction between childhood vaccines for routine prevention of va vaccine preventable diseases and influenza where uh, we have such a small proportion of the market share in the governmental control. CDC has no authority to regulate the distribution of vaccine or to regulate the manner in which vaccine is supplied. We rely on uh, our best technical advice. We rely on altruism, as you've described. We have experience with this in 2000, 2001, where we had a similar vaccine shortage. Uh, we found that overall uh, there was uh, adherence to the recommendations. And in fact, we ended up in many areas with excess doses of vaccine because people complied so carefully with uh, the recommendations. What we're talking about here is a very fine line between what we have and, and who needs it the most. And I just don't think that it's a matter of doses. It's also a matter of where are those doses. And we have no authority to redistribute the vaccine. Dr. Gerber, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to take the entire time because there's some members who haven't gotten to ask anything. Are you prepared to come back during the lame duck session and get some authority to do something now that you know full well that the private sector could turn you down and could decide on its own 
where we would, we would be go. delighted to work with Congress on, on solutions here. This is uh, our colleagues at FDA who are the regulatory agency have a, a role to play in this as well, but we, we would be very willing to look at all possible solutions. Well, I'm asking you and Mr. Crawford mm -hmm. uh, to, in fact, be prepared to, to if, now that there is no backup plan, now that we cannot in our economy force the private sector to do things with respect to uh, supplies in their hands, to be back here when we come here to tell us what it is we need to do. We can't just sit here saying we don't have the authority and there's nothing we can do about it. In order to let other members ask questions, I'm going to forgo the rest of my questions. Um, okay, yeah, Mr. Cooper, that's fine. I mean, we have I three minutes left in the vote. Mr. Cooper? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To follow up on my colleague's line of questioning, could this Congress save lives by passing a law making sure that only high priority recipients got the vaccine? Seniors, infants, people with chronic diseases, healthcare workers. Would that save lives in this country? I think I should defer that to Dr. Gerbeting. Um, basically, you're, you're saying that you would codify their recommendations, CDC's recommendations? With the force of law behind the voluntary guidelines that Dr. Gerbeting has mentioned, would that save lives in this country? Because in response to Mr. Konjurski earlier, it seemed like the normal casualty rate that we would face from influenza mm -hmm. could go up substantially this year as a result of this manufacturing shortage. You only have voluntary guidelines at your disposal, you're not empowered to do more, would you be able to save lives if you had that extra legal authority? I'm, I'm not prepared to answer that. I, I think she just mentioned that she was getting expected good compliance based on past years, but I'd better defer to Dr. Gerbing. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for you either. This is um, a work in progress here. As I said, in past years, we've been able to uh, have a good match between what we expect and how people adhere to those recommendations, whether we would have more benefit from codifying it or more mess from codifying it, I can't really tell you right now. And I think enforcement of that uh, would be a very difficult challenge to patch together on short notice. But uh, we will certainly look at that as an option. And as um, the Congresswoman suggested, come back with a set of issues and options that we could discuss with the committee during the uh, next session. Okay. I thank the chair. Thank you very much. I'm going to dismiss this panel uh, with our thanks. Well, we'll take a recess while we go vote and be back in about 15 minutes.
Yeah, one second. Teacher, do you have a question? Um, it's not clear to me whether there were more contaminated doses than Chiron went on. We don't know. I mean, but they were saying the entire time they had limited this to a few million doses. Well, I, well, I think um, I, I think they were acting in good faith. I, I don't have reason to, to think otherwise. But we're over there on the ground now, and we will know that answer. Uh, after that inspection takes place. Thank you. What, what did Chiron say that made you think that made anybody think there were system wide problems as opposed to this one time contamination? Uh, well, what this is within the uh, rubric of risk assessment. What uh, what the British government did is the same thing we would do. Is that if there were only eight doses that were, con I mean, eight lots that were contaminated, that might be enough to raise questions about the entire production because you know these bacteria actually can grow in the vaccine so even though you can't find them you can't be sure in some cases that it wasn't there and that's what we're worried about and that's why we've got to have people physically involved in inspecting I'm just wanted to clarify what's happening because as of August uh, we knew that there was problems with a certain small lot in Sharon and then what kind of inspection did you do, and what we, kind of inspection did we gave the them British? In, we gave them instructions, just as the British did, uh -huh. and they were to report to us on a weekly basis about their progress. And that's when they retested and they found it was only an isolated lot. Now, yep. between now and then, why is it that the British regulators intervened uh, to an extent that they had a greater concern that you didn't? I mean, what no, 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 that, no, no that, that's not true. They, they intervened on Friday of last week. And we would have intervened on Tuesday of this week. So, uh, you were so it's basic. Yeah, no, we had the, the key conference call, as I testified, mm -hmm. on Tuesday of this week, the same day the British made the announcement. So there's there's no lag in understanding. Yes, I, I just don't, I don't understand. They suspended the license. Tuesday is Tuesday. That's all you need to understand. But what information would that have been based on? I, I just don't understand. They suspended the license. Well, you have to ask the British what well, information they used. Well, you said you used. would have made the same decision. What well, we, information we don't, was they, Presumably, they gave them the same information they gave us. And if so, their conclusion should have been the same. Was the British decision based on an inspection by them, or was it based on I don't know. On, on Chiron to, telling them they have a problem? I can't speak for the British. Wait, one last question. Was there any obligation on Chiron's part to let the FDA know on Friday, since they knew on Friday? They did not know on Friday. They knew on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Order, gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Mr. Chairman, you really are fast with that gavel, and I love it. I learned it from you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I wasn't here earlier today when the hearing started, and this is on a related subject. Uh, I got my flu shot this morning, and uh, uh, I guess a lot of Americans so far haven't been able to do it because of the shortage. But the, the, the concern that I have is, is part of the contents of the vaccination that people are getting. Uh, there is a substance called thimerosal, which is about 50% ethyl mercury in the flu vaccine. And most adult vaccines have mercury in it. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger of California recently signed a bill in California which prohibits uh, children up to age three from getting a vaccination that contains thimerosal. And the reason for that is because the mercury in vaccines, and we've had hearings on this over the last four or five years, the mercury in vaccines is seen by many scientists around the world as a major contributing factor to neurological disorders such as autism in children and Alzheimer's in adults. Now, we're getting it out of most of the children's vaccines. It's in about three or four of the children's vaccines yet today. In California, they're going to get it out of all of them. 
which is a giant step in the right direction, and I congratulate the legislature out there and the governor of California for doing that. But we need to get mercury out of all vaccinations. Mercury is toxic to the human body, to the human neurological system. It is in the flu vaccine. It's in most of the adult vaccines. It needs to be uh, removed. You can go to single shot vials without having mercury in them. And Mr. Chairman, it would be great for the American people and for the world if we removed that. Mercury toxicity is a major ecological problem for the whole world. It's in our water, it's in our fish. We're being told not to eat fish in many cases because there's mercury in them. And yet we continue to put it in vaccines that's injected into our children and into our adults. We, we used to have one in 10,000 children that were autistic. It's now one in 166, according to CDC. We used to have Alzheimer's uh, that was recognized uh, quite frequently, but now it's become, you know, almost an epidemic. And so we need to get these toxic substances out of our vaccines. I, am, I think the pharmaceutical industry does a great job for the people of this country and for the world, but there are certain things that can be cleaned up. One of them is getting the mercury out of the vaccines. Uh, and so, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for yielding to me. And uh, this is just uh, another shot across the bow of the pharmaceutical industry to get the mercury out of all vaccines for the good of humanity. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for having this here. Mr. Burton, thank you very much. And I, you've certainly been consistent in your uh, position on this and unrelenting. We move to our next panel now, and I want to thank our witnesses for appearing. Invited to join us in our second panel are the three flu vaccine manufacturers to discuss vaccine production capacities to respond to the shortage crisis. We hear from Christine Grant of Aventus Pasteur, manufacturer of Fluzine, Fluzone vaccine. Dr. David J Johnson accompanies Ms. Grant, and he's available to respond to questions, and, and we'll swear you in. We also have uh, uh, Dr. James Young of, of Metamune, which manufactures the nasal spray vaccine, Flumist. Unfortunately, Representative uh, from Chiron is unable to attend this hearing, but the company has submitted written testimony for the hearing record. I ask unanimous consent that Chiron's testimony be included in the official hearing language and without objection, so ordered. And we also have a, a, a visitor to this, uh, this committee who I've known for many years, Dr. Robert Struby. He's the Virginia State Health Commissioner. He's no stranger to this committee either. He's here to provide an assessment of state and local public health departments' ability to respond adequately to the vaccine shortage threat. As you know, it's our policy. We swear all witnesses before you testify. So if you'd rise and raise your right hand, um, you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Ms. Grant, we'll start with you and we'll move straight on down. And I can't thank you enough for being with us and being patient uh, as we, we try to get through questions as quickly sure. as we can. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, Chairman Davis and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Venice Pasteur. During the past 10 years, Venice Pasteur has been a reliable supplier of influenza vaccine for the U.S., consistently increasing our annual production. And this year, we expect to produce 55.4 million doses, 33 million of which have already been been distributed. I'm here to communicate our company's pledge to continue to do everything we can to manage this influenza season consistent with the recommendations of federal and state health authorities. Vaccines have proven to be the most cost-effective preventive intervention in human history, and all of our employees are passionate about the contributions they make to life-saving work. Aventus Pasteur is the world's largest vaccine company with nearly 9,000 employees. The company's global experience has been utilized to manage influenza epidemics over many decades. Vaccine has been produced at the Swiftwater, Pennsylvania location for over 100 years, and influenza produced there for more than 30 years. Today, we produce approximately one half of the U.S. influenza vaccine supply. Although there, there have been years where disruptions and shortages have ensued in the influenza vaccine marketplace, Aventus Pasteur has consistently been able to deliver vaccine to our customers on a timely basis during influenza season. And as I previously stated, Aventus Pasteur intends to achieve its plan to produce approximately 55.4 million doses of flu zone for the U.S. this season. Customers had already placed orders for more than 30, excuse me, for more than 52 million of those doses prior to Chiron's announcement. This included approximately 4.5 million doses for the CDC, including the late season strategic reserve for which CDC proactively and wisely planned. And it's important to note that over 85% of all influenza vaccine is administered by the private healthcare sector.
So since hearing the announcement three days ago, we have worked with CDC and FDA to determine whether we can manufacture additional doses later this year. Any additional doses uh, available from going back into production, however, would not be available until February or March. And such a decision would have implications for the amount of vaccine which can be produced for next 2005-2006 season. Mr. Chairman, as we've heard today, the supply shortage has caused many policymakers to ask, why are there so few vaccine manufacturers in the U.S.? And what really needs to be done to encourage vac vaccine manufacturers? Over the last several years, we've testified before Congress about the urgent need for federal policymakers to do more to cherish and promote vaccine companies. And we suggest five recommendations to achieve this goal. First, demand for vaccine drives supply. We need to work together to steadily increase annual reliable demand to achieve Healthy People 2010 goals. This will give companies confidence to continue to reinvest and thus increase supply. Second, annualize the funding for CDC's strategic influenza vaccine reserve, which was only budgeted for two seasons, yet is proving to be a very wise investment. Third, liability exposure chills interest in this field. We are pleased to acknowledge the House of Representatives' passage of the jobs bill just late last night, which included the influenza vaccine excise tax, and we strongly encourage Senate and the White House to take quick action on the bill. This will ensure that influenza vaccine is now covered under the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Fourth, we encourage the committee and Congress to begin now to plan to address special vaccine liability issues that will occur when there is an influenza pandemic. Fifth, we also encourage the committee to help resolve inconsistencies between SEC accounting guidelines for routine pediatric stockpiles and CDC's desire to implement such stockpiles and for which Congress has already authorized and appropriated funding. We're all aware that vaccine companies have left the U.S. market in the last decade. This included two companies that approved influenza vaccine. And it's important to remember that even if a new company were to uh, plan a new facility today, it would require a minimum of five to seven years to build, validate, license, manufacture, and deliver vaccine to the marketplace. This is due to the inherent complexity of building reliable production facilities that meet necessary health and safety standards. Aventis Pasteur has been a leader in introducing innovative technology. We've learned through experience it takes years to develop and incorporate new processes into routine manufacturing. For example, we are working on the promising technology known as cell culture, but we caution that it's going to take years to transition this technique from research to full-scale production. Additionally, the technique will not substantially reduce the total production time. Mr. Chairman, we share the committee's concern and frustration with this year's supply problem. However, government authorities and the private sector have worked well together in the past to manage difficult situations to ensure optimal immunization rates. And we want to commend HHS, CDC, FDA's leadership for their immediate and decisive action to address what is inherently the unpredictable nature of vaccine production. In less than 12 hours, as you heard, CDC's uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices issued interim recommendations to prioritize influenza immunization for high-risk populations. The National Flu Summit, a public-private partnership of CDC, professional associations, public health authorities and companies and such as ours, have already discussed how best to implement those recommendations. And influenza professionals are recommending that healthcare providers who actually see patients are best equipped to determine who's at high risk. In summary, Aventis Pasteur pledges to continue to do everything we can do to manage this season consistent with the recommendation of, fate, of federal and state health authorities, and we commend Congress for your prompt interest to address this issue during your busiest week of your session. Thank you very much. Dr. Young, thanks for being with us. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon to address the committee on this very important topic, and I commend you on inviting members of uh, the uh, manufacturing community here to uh, provide their perspective. Uh, my name is Dr. Jim Young. I'm president of research and development at MedImmune, a biotech company headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland. As you may know, MedImmune is, a new, uh, is new to the influenza vaccine business, having introduced a new type of flu vaccine this past year called Flumist approved by the FDA for use in healthy individuals 5 to 49 years old. 
Unlike the other flu vaccines, which are injected into the muscle, this vaccine is simply sprayed into the nose to protect against influenza. Metamune currently has the manufacturing capacity to produce 20 million doses of Flumis. This year, however, we produced only 2 million doses of bulk vaccine, and before this week's event, events, had planned on filling and finishing only 1.1 million doses of those doses, which we did. That finished material, I'm pleased to report, was released for distribution by the FDA yesterday. I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, with the capacity to produce 20 million doses of this innovative vaccine, why did we only fill 1 million doses? Quite simply, because one, the product was approved with a very narrow label indication by the FDA. Two, it has been faced with significant confusion and even misinformation propagated in the, in the marketplace. Three, has not had strong support for the recommending authorities. And four, was launched into a climate of overwhelming complacency with a, la with a lack of awareness on the part of the public as to the severe illness and death that is associated with influenza. It is these factors that account for an insufficient demand to justify increased production of Flumis. Nearly eight months ago, I sat before this committee testifying that close to four million of the five million Flumis doses manufactured last season would be destroyed at the end of the 2003-2004 influenza season, a season in which there was a vaccine shortage and 152 children died from flu. 39 of those children actually were eligible to receive flu mist and could have received the vaccine but didn't. The fact of the matter is that there were 4 million lost vaccination opportunities with product we had available that went unused. Consequently, as a result of last, year's, last season's experience and based upon Flumis existing licensure for the restricted population of healthy individuals 5 to 49 years, Metamune planned very limited production this season, somewhere between 1 and 2 million doses. This was a substantial about face from our original intent when we decided to enter the influenza vaccine business nearly three years ago with a desire to increase the number of influenza manufacturers in the U.S. and work to fulfill the stated goals of public health officials to expand the number of U.S. citizens receiving influenza vaccination. However, in response to the vaccine shortage announced this week, we have committed to filling the remaining bulk material we have in inventory, actually starting today, and expect to produce up to 1 million additional doses of Flumis for distribution. Under normal circumstances, getting these additional lots of Flumis approved and released by the FDA would likely take well into December. However, we are in communication with the FDA and are hopeful that with their assistance, the timing of this release can be expedited. As they did during the flu crisis last season, the FDA has also indicated that it may be willing to consider waiving other logistical and distribution requirements, including the need for a freeze box to store vaccine in frost-free freezers in order to broaden the distribution of these additional doses. None of these expedited procedures will, of course, pose any added risk to the consumer or to the quality of the product. By producing up to 2 million doses for the healthy population between 5 and 49, we are freeing up 2 million doses of the injectable vaccine for use in the highest risk population, which could potentially save hundreds of lives. After our initial very disappointing and sobering experience as a flu vaccine manufacturer, we spent several months earlier this year evaluating whether we should remain in the influenza vaccine business or whether we should cut our losses and get out after dealing with the costly and overwhelmingly difficult regulatory landscape to bring this new and effective vaccine to the market. Our partner with Flumis last year, Wyeth, a former manufacturer of the inactivated flu vaccine, also went th through this same internal debate. In April, Wyeth opted to exit while Metamune decided to stay in the business. Metamune's decision to stay in the flu business was based on our continuing belief that influenza is an, is an extremely important disease and that flu mist is an important new addition in prevention, warranting our investment to become a meaningful contributor to the vaccine production in this country. Since taking over complete control of the future of flu mist, we have cut the price of the product from $46 a dose last year to a price as low as $16 a dose this year for, for the private market and negotiated even lower prices for government purchases. We are currently working with the CDC, VA, and DOD, providing them the option to purchase a significant proportion of the additional product we are now working to deliver to the marketplace. While we are here, all here today because of an imminent and serious vaccine shortage, I want to emphasize that the problem is much larger and transcends well beyond this season. As Speaker of the House Dennis Hastert stated on Wednesday, quote, there are only a handful of vaccine manufacturers left in the world. We know that our current production cap capabilities would not be able to handle a massive surge for vaccine products caused by a flu crisis. We need to take steps to address the situation before it becomes an even bigger problem.
bigger? How much bigger does this problem need to become? How many more hearings, analyses, consultants, discussions, and testimonies must there be before any action is taken? Already, King Pharmaceuticals, Wyeth, Park Davis, and Merck have pulled out of the influenza vaccine business over the past few years. So why are they exiting? Two reasons. First, to participate in the influenza vaccine business requires enormous investment in clinical, clinical development, manufacturing facilities, regulatory requirements, and currently the return on the investment is abysmal given the low price received for the vaccine. On our part, MedImmune has already invested $1 billion to bring flu mist to the market with what is a very narrow label and expects to invest $200 million more in an attempt to expand the indication to a broader U.S. population and an amount that you saw this morning from Dr. Fauci's presentation, which is greater than the NIH is expected to spend on flu mist over the next three years. Second, the demand for influenza vaccine is inconsistent, such that the manufacturers increase, uh, man that when manu such that when manufacturers increase capacity in anticipation of broader demand, interest often wanes and unused product is wasted. Demand is strongly influenced by policies set by the federal authorities. Current influenza vaccine recommendations primarily target high-risk individuals. However, the burden of influenza virus illness is significant in healthy persons who fall outside these targeted age groups as well, and in other, otherwise healthy, unvaccinated school-aged school age children who serve as vectors for transmission of influenza to their families and to high-risk individuals with whom they have contact. The vast majority of stakeholders in influenza prevention are reaching the same conclusion that the recommended population for influenza vaccination must be expanded greatly, a movement that we all endorse. A universal recommendation that all Americans receive annual flu vaccine will drive the demand for routine annual vaccination and the development of sufficient infrastructure to develop the vaccine, which will in turn provide the impetus on the part of us vaccine manufacturers to increase their production. This will also ensure the capacity needed to produce even larger quantities of vaccine in the event of the emergence of a new pandemic strain. Ironically, it is a situation like the one we're now faced with where we are telling healthy individuals not to get vaccinated, which runs counter to the message public health authorities need to send to expand demand. And unfortunately, history tells us that it will take several years before many healthy individuals again seek vaccination for flu. So what is it that MedImmune would specifically recommend that the federal government do? First, we believe that regulatory authorities should look again at the available scientific and clinical data pertaining to flu mist and reconsider a broader role flu mist could play potentially within the context of public health given the benefits that we have demonstrated in clinical studies of this vaccine. This is particularly relevant to the 50 to 64 year old high risk group that will otherwise go unprotected this year. Second, the government needs to find ways to incentivize companies to build manufacturing facilities in the U.S. There is an increasing trend for U.S.-based companies to build manufacturing plants offshore in order to gain access to a well-trained pool of potential workers as well as significant tax advantages. With this trend comes the increased risk of the type of event we, we are currently experience, experiencing. Companies will face regulatory decisions that may prevent product from entering the United States. Or worse yet, in the event of a catastrophic, catastrophic event or the emergence of a new pandemic strain, the host country may embargo vaccine for use within its own borders. Third, logistical and accounting issues needed to be, need to be sorted out so that the federal government can stockpile additional product or even bulk vaccine, a relatively inexpensive step in the manufacturing process. Bulk material could be stored for up to two year, years or until a new influenza strain is introduced and could be filled at a defined schedule as needed. Finally, the federal government should provide incentives for manufacturers to develop innovative production methods that could expand the capacity. They should make potential new vaccine strains available to the manufacturers sooner and eliminate the need for the FDA release for flu vaccine lots. All of these would result in earlier and greater product availability. In conclusion, I'd like to reiterate that MedImmune currently has manufacturing capacity to produce 20 million doses of influenza vaccine, and with the addition of our new $75 million state-of-the-art manufacturing facility currently being validated and modest changes in the works at our current full finish facility, we will soon be able to produce 40 to 50 million doses of vaccine. However, in order to make production at these levels a viable option, we need the federal government to help create sufficient support and demand to reduce regulatory hurdles and to place a far, far higher value upon influenza vaccination for all Americans. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank, thank you very much. Both of you, thank you for what your companies are doing as well. Uh, Dr. Strube, thanks for being with us. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, 
My name is Robert Struby, and I'm the State uh, Dr. Health Struby, get your, I'm sorry. I'm the State Health Commissioner for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I'm honored to be testifying before you today. I'd like to thank the Chair and the Committee for holding this hearing regarding the recent developments concerning the U.S. influence of vaccine supply. The recent flu vaccine shortage is creating a serious challenge for public health. The present system of vaccine production and distribution is incapable of effectively responding to the current demand for the vaccine, let alone a large-scale flu outbreak or pandemic. It is imperative that the federal government take steps now to improve our current flu vaccine production and distribution system. In Virginia, the Health Department ordered about 110,000 doses of flu vaccine from Chiron, which we will not receive. This is almost all the flu vaccine that we typically provide to adults through our 119 local health departments. Not having this vaccine will mean that many people, especially those at high risk for flu complications, will not be able to count on their local health department for a flu shot this year. At this time, we expect to only receive about 11,000 doses of adult flu vaccine, but this is just a drop in the bucket compared with the amount of flu vaccine that is needed for those people in our communities who are most vulnerable to serious complications from the flu. Any flu vaccine available through our local health departments will be provided to those people who are in the high-risk priority groups recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices this past Tuesday. The flu vaccine shortage hopefully will not impact the more than 115,000 doses of flu vaccine we have ordered from Aventus for children enrolled in the Vaccines for Children program. This program is for uninsured, underinsured children, Native American children, and those on Medicaid. But the Health Department provides only a very small proportion of the flu vaccine that is typically provided to the public. Most vaccine is provided by the private sector. The biggest difficulty in determining how much flu vaccine is available in the private sector with our state and how to advise our at-risk population on where to find any available vaccine. We do not have an instantaneous way of tracking flu vaccine availability in the private sector. We do not have any legal authority to redirect flu vaccine in the private sector. We're making every effort to encourage the medical community to follow the ACIP recommendations and prioritize the available supply for people in the priority groups identified. We have distributed information from the CDC to the healthcare community through our health alert network. Over 54,000 healthcare providers were notified by email or faxed Tuesday night and Wednesday. In addition to our outreach to the medical community, we distributed a statewide press release urging the prioritization of available flu vaccine. We've conducted numerous media interviews. We've taken hundreds of phone calls from citizens. We're providing people the best information we have available regarding this developing situation. The serious situations situations compounded by the fact we have gone to great lengths over the past few years to educate the public about the importance of getting their flu shot each year. We have not only encouraged people in the high-risk groups to get the flu shot, but more and more it's been encouraged for all people. We had just launched our statewide education efforts for this year prior to receiving the unexpected news from Chiron. Our education efforts have now been undermined again due to this situation. For example, we had to cancel our annual vaccinate and vote campaign, which targets the vaccination of high-risk individuals on election day. Six upcoming smallpox vaccination dispensing exercises for our bioterrorism preparedness program are now on hold because we were going to use flu vaccine to, to get volunteers to participate in these exercises. This current situation follows similar problems we had last year when we ran out of flu vaccine at the height of the season. Last year, VH, VDH, the Virginia Health Department, administered more than 160,000 doses of flu vaccine to the public, which is more than double the number of flu shots that we typically provide. When we ran out of flu vaccine last year, many high-risk patients went without vaccine. Parents could not get young children vaccinated, and healthcare providers could not vaccinate their staff. Attempting to prioritize vaccine to high-risk patients was a local health department nightmare. In some cases, security was needed to maintain control of demanding patients. Now Virginia and other states are faced with the difficulties of prioritizing a limited supply of flu vaccine again, even more limited than last year. We can anticipate that many people will go unvaccinated this year. As you know, only three companies are licensed in the U.S. to produce the vaccine. Chiron was expected to provide about half of the vaccine supply. Avenis is the other company that produced the flu vaccine for injection. The third company produces the live attenuated nasal flu vaccine, which is not targeted for the high-risk patients. As I stated earlier this year when I testified before this committee, Congress needs to support the development of a more reliable vaccine production and distribution process. The current year-long process is incapable of meeting increasing vaccine demands or timely adjustments to vaccine formulation. The nation's influence of program must include a comprehensive and clear, critical look at all aspects of the system, including production and distribution of vaccine. The current situation our experience over the past few years caused concern regarding our ability to effectively address an influence of pandemic in the U.S. Virginia has a pandemic flu response plan, but that plan cannot be effectively carried out without having an adequate supply of vaccines and antiviral medications. We must rely on the federal government to assure this. 
In Virginia alone, we estimate that during an influenza pandemic, there could be more than 1.3 million outpatient visits, over 28,000 hospitalizations, and over 6,200 deaths in a 12-week period. The thought of these statistics alone are enough to make improving the flu vaccine production distribution system a high priority. Given the estimated 36,000 people that die each year in the United States due to flu, I believe addressing the flu vaccine production and distribution problems should be a high priority for Congress. Government must support improvements of the vaccine production process and consider ways of ensuring that enough flu vaccine is available. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'd be glad to answer questions. Well, thank you all. Um, ask unanimous consent to put in the record a letter uh, from a Mr. Victor Schwartz uh, <coughs> talking about his concerns about product liability issues for national vaccine strategy. And we had a quick, we had something, Mr. Weinsman, put it in the record. Do you know who it was? Also ask unanimous consent to put into the record. A letter to Secretary Thompson signed by Evan Bayh and Rahm Emanuel. Uh, and without objection, those will go into the record. Um, let me start the questioning. Um, Dr. Young, on Metamune, uh, this just, uh, just was called my attention in terms of what NIH was telling some of their employees about the flu mist uh, for some of their health care workers. Uh, for healthy people, uh, who don't fall into those vulnerable areas, uh, flu mist is about all we're going to be able to get this year. Uh, what level of protection does that give? And if you're a health care worker uh, or a vulnerable population, why isn't this used for them? Can you explain that? Um, currently, because of um, the body of data we have from our clinical trials, um, supports the use in healthy 5 to 49-year-olds. That's where the FDA approved it. We have done numerous studies in younger populations, so older populations. Wait a minute. You're 5 to 49-year-olds. That's right. The vulnerable right. population 65 and over. The what? The most vulnerable, vulnerable population 65 and over. So mm -hmm. that leaves me out. I mean, what, what do you do if you're 55 It does indeed, old? although we've done studies. If you're uh, a 55-year-old healthy guy with warning track power, I mean, what does that, where does that put you? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I ask the same question. I'm 51 years old, and I ask, Another why should guy. I not be able to receive flu mist when my 49-year-old peer can? I certainly don't believe that I'm at, at any worse risk to receiving this that. This was vaccine. just the clinical trials, isn't that basically that's right. the answer? That's I mean, correct. there's no evidence that it doesn't work. It's just that's where it's been. Well, in tried. fact, we have our original clinical trial was in adults up to age 64, and um, it, it's a interesting situation where when we went to the vaccine advisory panel of the FDA the first time four years ago, they actually recommended approval for all adults up to age 64. In the meantime, two years later, uh, 50 to 64 year olds had become a recommended population for the vaccine. And when the committee was asked again, should this be approved now for 50 to 64 year olds, we were in a double jeopardy situation and they said, well, we think it's safe but we can't be sure that the efficacy has been demonstrated uh, sufficiently to recommend approval. We had actually gotten the reverse message from the FDA on that. They thought that we needed more efficacy data, when in fact there is no, all the evidence from the clinical trial suggests it's just as efficacious in that segment as in the lower population segment, uh, adult yeah. population segment. So I think we need to relook at that, particularly in a situation where last year we were recommending that 50 to 64 year olds are a high risk population, and yet now we're saying they shouldn't get it when in fact we may have a vaccine that could be useful in that population. Now, based on last year's sale, you produced a smaller supply of flu vaccine this year. Is that, is that right? That's correct. Um, with the vaccine shortage this season, will that affect your decision next year? And is there any way you can cook up a larger batch this year? Or is it just too late to? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my testimony, we actually had some additional unfilled product in inventory in freezers, which we are now thawing out and reef and filling to provide a, uh, potentially another million doses of vaccine. But we can't ramp up de novo new additional supplies beyond that. Whether it will uh, uh, influence us to produce more vaccine uh, remains to be seen. We still have a lot of questions in the marketplace, a lot of confusion. Just this morning, you heard Dr. Gerberding report about the revised recommendations that came out two days ago, suggesting that Healthy healthcare workers and those who care for young, young children 
should be encouraged to use flu mist. While, while she was testifying that, the NIH put out a memo to their employees saying they should not, in their hospitals, should not receive flu mist. So again, adding to the confusion that the agencies are putting out different mis mixed messages out there to um, their constituencies. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Grant, um, you mentioned in your testimony that demand drives supply. Um, what can the government do to help ensure that the demand for the annual f flu vaccine is predictable? We do that for farmers. I mean, you have I mean, vaccine is, is pretty important. Well, I'm going to start with a, a non-financial incentive first, and that is to make sure that we're all pulling in the same direction in looking at the groups that aren't getting immunized. Only 67 percent of the seniors are getting immunized today, and yet we all know that's a recommendation so that we could work with our agencies that care for Medicare patients. Uh, only 37 percent of our health care professionals in a, in, in a year are getting immunized. They obviously are role models as well as uh, needing to protect themselves. So we need to pull together to make clear year after year that we aren't anywhere near meeting the Healthy People 2010. I think uh, the other issue, uh, a financial incentive that needs to continue to be discussed and reviewed is you heard about the strategic <coughs> stockpile this year. And certainly that has turned out to be a wise investment that CDC thought of planning for having a few extra million doses. Um, and that is something which I would encourage your committee to continue to look on favorably. Now, a little, uh, a little of a good thing goes a long way, and then we have to balance to make sure what the appropriate sizing of such an annual strategic stockpile would be so we don't risk throwing away excessive doses. But those two approaches would help drive um, s demand, which will drive supply. Thank you. Mr. Kandrowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have the great honor and privilege of being the uh, member of Congress representing uh, Advantis uh, in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, and I have the, had the occasion to be at the plant on numerous occasions where 1,700 of some of the most highly qualified people are working day and night to provide protection not only for, for, for influenza but other uh, necessary vaccines. My impression, having been there and met with the officials of that organization, is one, uh, their first mission is to uh, meet the needs of the American population and the world population to fight infectious diseases such as influenza. Uh, it seems to me they have the capacity to do so. They are frustrated, if I may say, that government has not participated in the best way to get that done. We talk about it. We have hearings on it, I think, as the Secretary referred and the other gentlemen in the panel, but nothing seems to be accomplished. And it seems that the Congress has hearings when we find out a disaster such as this occurs, but the, after that we all go home, and I dare say we won't have another hearing on vaccinations or vaccines until the next terrorist attack or other such pandemic occurs in the world, and we'll all come in here, rub our hands, and say, oh, how didn't we all prepare for this? When all of the three witnesses today that are appearing at this panel and the three earlier witnesses are telling us out that there are things we can do to make sure that we smooth out the line for demand, that we anticipate future needs, that we anticipate pandemics, and that we prepare to meet those challenges at relatively small cost. I think I heard the figure of $100 million for a plant, and uh, I, I think I've heard in the past maybe a billion dollars of investment and other uh, uh, incentives to this industry would really bring us up to high speed to prepare for whatever we need at the highest technical response uh, that science can give us and industry can give us. And I did a little calculation. And, and it was part of my antagonism toward the first panel. I'm sure they're capable in doing the best they can. But what you're talking about, if it were a billion dollars, would cost us only two days of the cost of the Iraq war. And we're talking about the risk of 300 million Americans and 6 billion people in the world. When you look at the numbers in any regard and the, the lead time necessary to meet these challenges, the expenditures of two days of the, of the Iraq war or a week of the Iraq war is minuscule. And that money, I think, could be made available by, by the Congress, and probably there's a full intent to do so, except we have pretty terrible 
communication between the executive branch with a plan, the Congress with a response of priority, and then the people are going to do the work, the private sector in this country and all around the world that seem to be left out except when they run into a problem or we have a problem. Then we have this tremendous partnership that joins for this few days to soothe the American population so that everybody can go home and think that we're prepared. We're neither prepared for a world influenza epidemic and we're certainly not prepared for a biological attack. So with all this criticism, Mr. Chairman, it's not without a suggestion. I've enjoyed all of my visits to Adventus. I think they would entertain either this full committee or a representative portion of this committee to come up to the great Pocono Mountain areas for a day or two, show you what they do, show you what the industry does, show you the lack of coordination and cooperation between government and the industry and our various regulatory authorities, and that we could walk away in 24 or 48 hours with an actual knowledge of what has to be done by this Congress and the executive branch of this government to really put a coordinated response to the challenge of viral and bacteria infections in the United States. I highly recommend it. Now, I know I have a few moments left. And I'll, well, I'll ask the staff to, to look at that, too. I, I think your you're, it's my invitation. Come on up there, and you. you'll enjoy it, and I'll get you to something. It'll certainly be team. better for you than the time I was, last time I was in your district. So. <laughs> I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Grant represents Adventists is here. I just want to throw the question is, what do you think the government has to do to help your company and other companies meet these challenges, not only of influenza, but biological attack? What do we have to do? Okay. And lay it out and be candid with it. Well, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Congressman. And uh, we are equally honored to have you and your capable staff representing our employees in, in our district. So I thank you. And I would say we certainly welcome uh, the committee's visit uh, to the great state of Pennsylvania and the wonderful uh, Poconos. You, you might want to consider doing it uh, before the snow sets in but, uh, or after, but we'd love to have you up there. Um, Congressman, I had mentioned five recommendations, and, and I'll just uh, reiterate uh, two at this at this point. First of all, and it's a, it's the kind little kind of thing that I that I mentioned, and that is uh, for some reason uh, there are SEC accounting guidelines that just popped up in the last year or so, which suddenly have created inconsistencies with the language that CDC has been using quite successfully with our and other companies for many decades to build strategic stockpiles. And so it's like the old adage of, you know, but for the um, nail in the horse's shoe, the battle, battle was lost. And so this little thing would seem certainly within the purview of this committee to perhaps talk about getting those two agencies together and to see if we can't work that out. The second issue, the very important issue, you mentioned planning for a pandemic. Uh, CD, CDC, through the National Vaccine Program Office, has just put out a draft plan for pandemic. We would strongly encourage this committee to think about the need to prepare now for the inevitable vaccine liability concerns and exposure that are going to emerge when any company in the world is asked to prepare um, a pandemic vaccine that by its very nature will not have had years of clinical trials and experiences. And we, what we are saying is we need to, to bring that issue to your attention. We need to work with you to make sure that we balance compensation and liability concerns so you are not disappointed uh, when companies point out uh, that they just can't get in the business of working on the pandemic vaccine when we're in the middle of a pandemic. So those are two of the five um, that I'd, I'd bring to your attention. Thank you very much, and again, uh, thank you for what your company is doing. Um, Mr. Cooper, thanks for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If we focus on the short-term concerns for a second, uh, the earlier panel discussed the possibility of being able to have the dose so that twice as many people could receive uh, the vaccine or the flu mist. What are the practical obstacles to making that happen, assuming that you got FDA approval for that? I'm sorry, sir. Oh, um, that, as Dr. Fauci said, that certainly is something that I, I'm not sure it is a short-term short solution, uh, because here we are in the midst of a season 
where we've already set, we are already being advised by the public health authorities not to go the route of immunizing healthy individuals. And as you heard, the, the trials done to date have been on healthy individuals. So while I believe um, um, my medical colleagues would um, suggest that there may be some promise in looking at that, it's probably too late this year to really think that that's going to solve our problem. I'd be happy to ask my colleague, Dr. Johnson, to comment if he, if he mm -hmm. wishes to add. If, if I can make a comment to that, I, I think the, the biggest concern is that there is concern now that the injectable vaccine doesn't work as well in the elderly as their immune system starts to decline with age. And so the thought of having the dose in a population which is currently thought to be suboptimally responding to the vaccine. But, but your product is, is for the healthy, 549. Right. Could you have the dose there? Um, actually, half the dose would still fall in the um, uh, specification for the vaccine. So um, you could do it. The then problem is that then you'd have to adjust the shelf life to make it a much shorter half life so that it doesn't fall below that spec over time. And so unless the vaccine is used very quickly, uh, that would be a problem. But flu mist could probably do it if you got FDA approval. Yeah, un unfortunately, there's not a lot of data that supports being able to do that. Well, I said if you got FDA yes, approval. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Second question. A number of jurisdictions across the country, unfortunately, ordered only from Chiron. What do we tell those jurisdictions that basically have no flu vaccine at all right now? Are you addressing that to me? Both. But, mm -hmm. um, as Dr. Gerberding said, literally Tuesday morning as uh, blackberries were <laughs> being worked at another hearing and the, and the uh, impact of this announcement became known, our company began to work with her staff to uh, begin to understand which states, particularly the public health sector, although it only buys about 10 percent of the vaccine, is and is not, does and does not have access. And as you heard, and I'd like to reiterate, what we're working on together um, is to figure out uh, where there is lack of coverage and then do the best we can. And as she said, it won't be perfect, but the pledge is to try to make sure that uh, we're able to provide some vaccine to all public health sectors. Let me put in a word for Nashville, Tennessee, because it's my understanding that none of our hospitals in our city uh, were able to get any vaccine. So it would be helpful uh, there. A third uh, for Adventists, um, when you sell the uh, vaccine to a distributor, are there any uh, safeguards against price gouging in the contract? Okay. Well, in the case of a distributor, by their very nature, they intend to sell it on. So as far as our contract goes, we do not uh, per se have controls over the price they, they charge. I will say, however, um, Congressman, that as both an attorney and as a former health commissioner, I'm well aware of the price, I think we all should be aware of the price gouging laws that exist in every state. And certainly our company would find that behave, any kind of price gouging behavior absolutely outrageous and would encourage, if we hear from any customer or patient, to uh, contact their local authorities to find out what their remedies are. How would you define price gouging? As a doubling of the price, or what, what would it be? Well, that's, that's an interesting question, and, and, and I, really have, I really haven't thought about it to, to begin to volunteer a standard. But, but I think it might be one of those things we'd know when we, when we see it. Mm -hmm. People are going to have a hard time reporting it unless we give them an idea of what the standard would be. If they don't know what they're going to report, you know, What's, what is the average vaccine? Uh, what should well, it sell for? Well, I, I, I would just say that our company has made very clear, our, our, our prices are, are known. Um, what is would the, be visi visible. What um, is the As price? was suggested, in general, it varies by the, the customer class mm -hmm. in, and, the, and the type of vaccine. In general, this year, it's between 8 and $10. And then the pediatric vaccine, the list price is about $12 a dose. So if customers were to see $20, $25, that would be a doubling of the price, and that might count as gouging. A customer certainly might want to ask questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other long-term concerns. Um, I appreciate everyone's testimony. I think you've given this panel and Congress a lot to think about, and hopefully we'll be able to respond not only to this sort of problem, but also um, a possibly larger problem should bird flu or things like that. Before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. Thanks for your patience.
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to uh, thank all the witnesses for their, their testimony. And uh, uh, Dr. Young, thank you for um, your testimony. MedImmune is in, in my congressional district, uh, Mr. Chairman, right here in Gaithersburg. So I, I think that when we're planning that trip, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to, while we're planning that trip, uh, we should make sure we stop uh, in Gaithersburg, which is, of course, a very, very close by here. And I'm sure that the company would be uh, happy to have the committee visit. Um, let me, let me uh, ask uh, uh, you, Dr. Young, or an anybody else, um, you, but you in your testimony talked about the fact that there were a number of children last year who died of, of flu uh, who would have been eligible to re receive flu mist. And you were here, I think, for the testimony of Dr. Uh, Gerberding, and she was very reluctant to answer the question, what will be the direct health effects of this shortage that we're facing now? Uh, in terms of the numbers of deaths uh, and the number of people hospitalized. And her answer was, we can never predict the severity of the flu season and flu strain. And that, I understand that in terms of absolute numbers. But in terms of percentages, uh, what, uh, you know, we're given a, particularly, a particular flu season uh, and the severity of that. Do you have any estimate as to what this crisis is going to mean in terms of uh, additional lives lost in this country? Yeah, I, th I think it's very hard to come to a precise number, and it all depends on how well the available supplies of vaccine are deployed to the highest risk individuals. Clearly, if we can continue to administer the available vaccine in that highest risk elderly population, then clearly we can avoid um, uh, a fair number of, of uh, deaths, uh, much like previous years. Right. Now, I, I guess question, maybe this was asked earlier, but um, uh, Aventus obviously has got contracts with certain you know, providers already. Uh, and a, some of those, I assume, are providers who are going to be providing the product to people in the healthier uh, range who would be eligible for flu mist. Uh, I guess the question is whether or not uh, there's a, any discussions underway where we would redirect uh, the Adventist product, which has been cleared for the, the broad age group, to the people at most severe risk and allow um, a flu mist to be directed to those in the healthier age range. Okay. Well, and I, I hope I gave the right figure before. About 33 million of our um, vaccine doses have already been distributed, and they certainly were, I'm sure, sold to customers caring for all different um, populations. And you heard Dr. Gerberding say that as we speak, um, our people are working with her people to figure out, certainly at, at the county level, where vaccine is. So I think we're always open. I mean, that will be, of course, a matter among the health providers at that level. Um, the, the sheer scale, it would be unwise to promise too much because the sheer, sheer scale, the right. difference between the vaccine that we had produced and, and what, um, under best of circumstances, can be available from flu mist won't solve the problem. But of course, we'll work together with uh, through CDC. Uh, let me ask you, you, you mentioned uh, Dr. Uh, Gerberding and the fact that you're in discussions with some of your, the, the people you provided uh, the product to and uh, trying to figure out where, where it is and how we can get it to the most at need and risk populations. Um, do you, f is, has there been any reluctance on, on the part of Adventists to provide that information to uh, public health officials at the county and state mm -hmm. levels? Um, I wouldn't characterize, uh, I, I think the cooperation has been terrific, and as I understand, and in personally talking with her and personally talking with uh, uh, our CEO who's been working with her, we're trying to do everything as best we can. We are suggesting that there are some ways, just last year, when we faced the late season surge demand, and there was sort of the first instinct to, well, let's know where all the vaccine is, and having worked in the field for some 30 years, our people knew that a lot of that vaccine had already been distributed, so that probably the first instinct should be, let's ask people what they still have. You know, rather than trying to set up an enormously elaborate information system, sending things out, wondering why we're not hearing back, just go out to people generally and say, if you have vaccine, please contact your local health officers. And that was actually rather successful. So I don't think it's a question of reluctance. I think it's a question of talking through practically what are you likely to get in the way of the best response to solve the problem. And that's, that's as I understand, where we are. Very good. Now, I understand that with respect to um, 
the, the, the flu mist because of the, a whole, the whole range of issues you discussed in your testimony. You didn't plan to produce uh, more this year. And given the production times, it's just not feasible to do more than another additional million doses. Is, is that, that's right? That's absolutely I mean, correct. As I listened to the testimony, Dr. Fauci testified about some very important and good long-term options. But as we discussed the short-term options, I think your testimony is pretty clear. It's not so much in terms of our ability to generate more vaccine, it's a question of just using what we've got and redistributing it. Oh yeah, if you look at the, the long-term planning that goes into supply requirements, uh, it's, it's years of planning. We have long-term three-year, four-year contracts with uh, the egg producers to make sure we have supplies of, of uh, substrate we need to grow the vaccine. Um, once, we, once we finish our campaign and, and stop making vaccine, the egg supply dries up and consequently we, we can't go back and manufacture more product uh, in, a, in a rapid response mode. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to really understand up front where the demand is going to be in order to ensure we have uh, adequate supplies on hand. Right. Uh, let me just ask one more. In, in previous years, as I understand it, individuals in the 50 to 65 year range were also defined to be at high risk. Is that, is that right? That is correct. And yeah. so when, when we get the list now of who's a high-risk group, it's really not based on a health decision. It's saying, here's the doses we've got available. These are the people most at risk, That's but right. that these other individuals in this other age category, in terms of a health analysis, right. they, are, they, they continue to be at risk as much this year as they were last year, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's basically a triage system to say, with limited supply, who can we prioritize and, and ensure that we have the least, the, the greatest benefit for the for the amount of vaccine we have, and and that's it's a very difficult decision to be to have to say to someone last year you we we told you to get the vaccine this year we're telling you not to get the vaccine. Thank thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Van Hall? We got a minute, a few. Any? Thank you all very much. I've got um, I know Ms. Blackburn's on her way over, so I'm going to ask a couple other questions as well. Dr. Struby, let me ask you. For those individuals who don't fall into the high-risk priority group for the flu vaccine, uh, what precautions can they take to reduce their risks of contracting the flu? What we put out in, um, I was trying to find my press release here so I can tell you exactly what we're telling people. It's basically wash your hands if you have, uh, anytime you think about it, anytime you've been uh, with somebody or if you have a runny nose to keep from spreading. Um, to use good um, hygiene, to avoid, uh, if you are sick with the flu, going in nursing homes around people who are ill, um, those are the type of recommendations we're making. Now, washing the hand, I mean, it's not, how does that, how does washing the hands help? Because your hands That's come in contact you spread with your face yeah. and everything you else. Go through it and rub your mouth, eyes, and, yeah. and then you picked it up in your hands and then you're transmitting it back to so yourself. So washing your hands frequently would be one thing. It's one thing. I mean, that's a traditional public health me message for all kinds of things, but that's one of the things we're stressing right now. What are now. we trying to do in Virginia uh, since the British supply is now canceled uh, for us? Uh, we're going to try to work with the Center for Disease Control in Avondas and try to get some of that release for our vulnerable population? Well, yesterday we had a video conferencing with all our health directors all across the state and their staffs. And we're trying to find out what's going on from Southwest Virginia, Northern Virginia, the whole place on it and come up with some consistent policies for the state. And so we put a freeze yesterday on the vaccine we did have until we can sort out where it is and make sure it's equitably distributed. Some place, some of our local health departments got vaccine directly, others didn't. And so we want to try to do that. We want to come up with some uh, knowledge of where the most needs are. Yesterday we were overcome, overwhelmed with uh, nursing homes calling and said they got, they were relying on getting uh, the vaccine from Chiron and don't have it. And so we have to sort out who's got vaccine, who needs it, and then figure out how we can match that up on it. And some will be persuasion, hopefully uh, moving some of the vaccine that people have and using their goodwill to let us take it to other places on it. Uh, we were actually hoping that we'd be able to do more with the having of the doses, but that doesn't look like that's going to be viable. What about a pri how do private doctors get it? Do they get it through the state or can they no. contract individually? In Virginia, they contract directly with the distributors okay. on it. Um, Are you coordinating with them too to see what they have available yes. or what doctors might? Exactly. People. We sent out, like uh, I was saying, 54,000 emails and faxes went out um, 
late Tuesday, early Wednesday to all the health care providers. We have a law in Virginia now requires them to provide their email and fax to us, and we have that on a database. And so we send it out, Thanks. urging them to work with us, and we'll be following up on that, trying to, at a local level, that will be tasked off to our districts. Well, thanks. I mean, let us know how we can help. Obviously, we want to, you learn from what's happened this year, and uh, we just, we don't want a reoccurrence, but we've got to get through this year as well. So uh, this has been very helpful, I think. Uh, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our um, panel for being here, all the witnesses that have participated today. Um, in my state in Tennessee, this is something that is um, important to us. and. We are, of course, concerned about our supply just as everyone else is. And we have two, two suppliers, Chiron and does about a third of the supply, and then Aventus does about two-thirds of the supply. And my question, uh, Ms. Grant, is to you. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony, in your written statement, that demand drives the supply. And what can the government do to help ensure that the demand for the annual flu vaccine is more predictable each year? Because one of the things that concerns me, and this is the reason that I ask, ask the question of you, is it seems that so many times, regardless if we're looking at public health policy or we are looking at operational policy for, for government, governmental entities, whether it's a federal, state, or a local, entity, we are more reactive than proactive. And we fail to plan, we think in short-term segments and not long-term segments. And um, we know that uh, you all have said, more than one of you have said in your written statements, in your testimony, that it takes from five to seven years for a new company seeking to locate in the U.S. to be able to provide that, um, that vaccine. So, you know, I want you to, if you will, talk for just a moment about process and what we could do to do a better job with uh, the predictable nature of uh, what we would need each year. Okay. Well, as um, I mentioned in a couple of the recommendations, uh, that it's very, very important that we all speak with the same language consistently that despite the occasional setback, as we clearly are going to face this year, which is frustrating all of us, that we have to all agree that we're going to pull together to continue to recommend to the various risk groups the importance of being immunized. For example, and it's interesting in Tennessee, I know that they're taking very seriously something that wasn't taken seriously a couple years ago, and that is the importance of using standing orders when people are admitted to hospitals or nursing homes to make it very easy and routine. That's a process. It's a simple thing in a sense. It's not so simple to execute it, but it's a simple thing to ensure that every single patient in a resident of a nursing home or hospital, year in, year out, is offered influenza vaccine. And there are millions of those patients, and that would be a, have a profound effect on a certainty that demand of all hospitals in all states we knew would do that. We would know how much more vaccine is, is, is likely to be utilized. We talked about the healthcare workers, only 37%. If we had a common understanding that healthcare workers are ready, willing, and able to um, and interested in protecting themselves and their patients by being immunized. So th there are many individual things that we can do. I mentioned the strategic reserve. Again, while the strategic reserve is not the total solution, the predictability of the government working with, uh, with us collectively to think about what's the appropriate amount to guarantee that the government sector is interested in buying. I mean, we're not looking for that to be the total solution. It's a private market. It's working reasonably well. But those are a couple very important things uh, that we could start talking about. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Young, I'd like to hear from you and then Ms. Grant uh, talking about with a company who wants to locate, wants to uh, create a flu vaccine in the five to seven year window of time, which I think really is pretty optimistic uh, if you're, you're looking at it. But knowing the demand for vaccine um, is not going to be decreasing, it's going to increase. Talk for a moment, if you will, about what you think 
that we should be looking at to shorten that window of time to create some efficiencies within what is a very heavily bureaucratic system which makes it very difficult for anyone who is doing R&D work or creating a vaccine to um, walk through that process. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a very um, complex issue at, at, to say the least. Um, clearly, the vaccine business, the, the entire pharmaceutical business is highly regulated, as it well should be to protect the, the safety of the, the public who receives these vaccines and, and drugs. Um, so clearly, very stringent standards have been established for current ma good manufacturing practices. And um, it's quite clear that it takes significant investments to meet those standards, to um, design, construct, validate. We have to demonstrate that the, the process works re reproducibly within certain uh, parameters, uh, uh, time in and time out to assure the quality of the product. It's particularly um, significant when you start talking about biological products like this. It's not like chemical processes that are very easy to control and maintain strict control over the parameters of production. It's the manufacturing of biologic process, uh, products that become uh, very um, labor intensive and, and testing intensive to assure the high quality of that product. So unfortunately, there aren't really any easy shortcuts to, um, to building, uh, building a plant, designing a plant, and then validating and operating that plant. Uh, we have to uh, put in some very strict standards to assure that the reproducibility, the safety, and the, and the potency of that product time in and time out. And unfortunately, there just aren't any shortcuts to doing that. Ms. Grant. Um, I would say, certainly as a company, we're used to planning five, ten years out, and so while it is, it is a long time frame, those, the most important thing I would say for the government and this committee to think about right now are two, two or three things not to do. Um, to, to sell our management and our shareholders in the world that we should continue to increase our capacity, which we want to do at Aventus. Um, we have to make sure that uh, the government is, is not going to uh, chill our, our interest. So two things I would not do, I would not think about what is sometimes described as the uh, GOCO or the government operated facility. Um, that's, that's not what we're looking for in the way of competition. We're looking for healthy uh, private sector competition and we're, we'll welcome that. I think the second issue is the notion around that we're sort of skirting around today some of the taking issues. Um, we would like to say that the first order of business is to really work collaboratively with the public sector to make sure we get through tough situations and season, uh, seasons without sort of jumping to, to more draconian solutions. It is always very welcome um, to have Congress um, work with state officials on environmental issues to make sure that, that while we never compromise safety or, or other standards, that nevertheless that things we work together and know that we want to get there in, in the next few years and, and work out those, those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, this, just a couple of last questions and we'll let everybody go. Um, Ms. Grant, it's already October. Soon you're going to begin the process of developing and producing the new flu, uh, flu vaccine for next year. What, what does this do to avoid the shortages next year and the contingencies? And we're not even sure that Chiron will be producing next year at this point. I mean, how do you factor that in? Well, cer certainly um, everyone in our company who uh, is very concerned about that type of issue, and uh, I can only finish by c repeating the pledge that, we're, that we are taking into account all the information in the environment, just as this year we're seeing how we can optimize, maximize our production capability. This will certainly influence uh, as we hear more from the government over the next month or so, what, what we can do. Um, we do have a certain uh, maximum capacity. We are scraping up against that, but, but we're going to do everything possible to make sure we yeah. maximize. Yeah, easy for me to say, but then all of a sudden, if everybody else gets into business and you're stuck uh, holding 40,000 or 40 million shots, then uh, you, you, you know, it, it hits you financially. So that's, isn't that part of the equation? Um, it is a factor. 
And I, I just would say that's why we have to work together to make sure that we continue to increase the demand so that we always right. feel comfortable our, our ability to sell increased supply is justified by seeing the demand will be there. Yeah. Well, we appreciate what you're doing. I'm glad you're here this year, this year of saviors this year. And Dr. Uh, young, that goes for your company as well. I, you, same answer that I just talked about in terms of capacity for next year. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we have to look at the overall situation. Clearly, if more vaccine were available and the the recommending bodies would be more proactive in trying to promote the use of the vaccine, just like they've this year cut back on on vaccine when it's uh, the recommendations in terms of of uh, who should get it to, or to prioritize who gets the vaccine. In the event there's excess vaccine, they ought to be going the other direction and saying, look, we have extra vaccine. We ought to be using it in more broadly in kids. We're only, you know, 10% of kids get vaccinated now. We, we ought to be pushing that in that event in, in, the, in order to yeah. spurn more, more demand. And 36,000 deaths, that, that's a lot of people that could have probably been, uh, in, any of those been vaccinated? I mean, these are the people who don't get vaccinated for the most part, right? It, it certainly is an issue. We knew last year when that a number of the children, most of the children, sadly, the pediatric cases that resulted in death had not been vaccinated. So it's, it's the public needs to understand that it's a very serious disease in the elderly and the young children and uh, make sure they, they are immunized. And guys like me and Dr. Young, I guess we just keep washing our hands and when we look at it. But thank you very much for both of you for, for what you're doing. Dr. Struby, thank you for your leadership at the state level. Uh, let's work with you every way we can in the, in the Commonwealth. Uh, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Today on Washington Journal, independent presidential candidate Ralph Nader on the debates, his response to debate questions, and his efforts to get on the ballot in several states. Washington Journal, live at 7 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN.